Hello and welcome to the Nausicast. The Nausicast where we go through each movie made by Studio Ghibli in release order and we discuss our analysis and research findings. Today we're going to continue our grand narrative of analyzing Goro Miyazaki's uh, legacy and career in the context of how fucking tyrannized he is by Miyazaki Sr. So uh, with this we are going to be talking about From Up on Poppy Hill, uh, a 2011 movie directed by, as I said, Goro Miyazaki. And, you know, you can listen to this podcast right here on YouTube or right here on your podcasting app, depending on where you're listening to it, or on Spotify. And our... My co-hosts... Not our, my co-hosts. You two uh, are come my on, come on. Be, be a true leftist. Our Our co-hosts. Co but who is our? Like, who are we referring to? Me and the audience. Uh, yeah. The yeah, co-host is also today. a host. Ah, Platon Skull. <laughs> yes, it's me, Platon Skull. Uh, pronouns are he, him, um, and I am ready to uh, discuss uh, what I believe to be the only Ghibli work uh, that deals with themes of incest. It's also the only Ghibli work that shows peeing, um, incidentally. <laughs> um, and the other co-host of the day... The Thunderer. Hello, I'm the Thunderer, pronouns they, them. Um, and I'm here to scold Goro on his complete misunderstanding of household appliances in the 1960s. It's honestly offensive. I'm very much looking forward to that. And, of course, you, as always, have me, Nyard, he, him. So, let's get right into this. This is, again, a movie directed by Goro Miyazaki. And the first question on your mind might be, how and why? Because, as we all remember, the fallout after Tales from Earth Three was uh, Miyazaki Senior, Senior, like really scolding Goro and really not liking the movie much at all. We uh, have to wonder how it came about that they let Goro do one again. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this project kind of came about, and I suppose the reason they uh, uh, the Goro even was in discussions of helming this project is. Well, first of all, there's the ongoing project within Studio Ghibli to try and get any fresh young new directors, of which they apparently only have Yonobayashi and uh, Goro Miyazaki. So, you know, you kind of got to count your blessings and, you know, just go with what you have. You know, it's like uh, Miyazaki is like, I want a new director. We have a new director at home and it's like Goro at home. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and Miyazaki's like, no, not like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, not not to shit on Goro though. Like, uh, as we yeah. will discuss in this podcast, Goro has come a long way. This movie is a in 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 many ways a step up as a director. Although maybe the Thunder, maybe you have a, a different it's, take on it. It's, I don't it's, know. I, I I agree. It's more competent. I'll, I'll give him that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there are some like really uh really good directorial touches uh scattered throughout the the film and, and, it, and it just generally shows a bit more like j just a, just a bit more uh confidence and poise uh which is uh like yeah that's pretty good especially yeah. for someone's second you know d directorial feature like like yeah. uh, like we we discussed in in the podcast episode about uh, Earthsea, which uh, go listen to that if you haven't. Uh, it's an interesting movie to talk about that uh, that Goro like came from uh, like architectural design, landscape and, uh, architecture, yeah, landscape architecture, yeah, to uh, uh, like directly to directing uh, an animated feature film uh, in Tales from Earthsea. So like, uh, you, you know, like n there's. There's there's no excuse for a bad movie, but like there's there there can be explanations. Um, Indeed, yeah, but, um, but but here he shows some market improvement. But the way to get him into the director's chairs this time around wasn't really straightforward, because the project to adapt from Up on Poppy Hill had been stewing in Miyazaki Senior's mind for a while, uh, actually since the eighties, where and this is an anecdote that Goro and Miyazaki Senior recount in two different versions of interviews that I've found, where um, they have a cabin in the mountains, where um, it appears that a niece and nephew of Miyazaki Senior's 
came in, brought their manga magazines with them, read the manga. Miyazaki just decided to grab a shoujo magazine magazine and read a story. And that story was from up on Poppy Hill in its original run. And apparently, Hideaki Anno and Mamoru Oshii were present. And the three got into debating whether or not you could adapt this story. This is the legend <laughs> as it is told. It seems those kind of sleepovers with uh, other famous anime directors at the time, not yet famous anime directors, I suppose, uh, was quite the uh, frequent occurrence. And as we, I think, in Tales of Earthsea recounted, uh, Goro always got along better with Oshi. <laughs> Anyways, um, Goro was also reading the manga at the time and uh, uh, appeared to also have been a bit into it. Um, but this is where the original idea came from, from Miyazaki. In the 80s, reading that random-ass manga and just deciding, I'm gonna adapt this someday. And 30 years later, for some reason, the door on his unconscious opens and from up on Poppy Hill pops out. He kind of, after Ponyo has stated that he thinks fantasy isn't really appropriate anymore and he really wants to have something more grounded as the next project, even though he just wrote Arietti the year before, which is also fant fantastical, but I guess, you know... Um, the, his mind works in mysterious ways. So at first they weren't sure whom to give the project because the initial project idea was of course drawn up by Miyazaki and he wrote like a proposal of like one page and they tried to figure out, okay, who's going to get the project? And Goro was interested in the project and uh, because of the manga and I think it was actually Suzuki himself who suggested, oh, let's try Goro again. And this led to a protracted process of getting Goro to draw the storyboards, which was quite the stressful and uh, uh, trying period for Goro, because um, as an <laughs> NHK it. documentary we've all watched shows, Miyazaki did not give him an easy time with yeah. the first designs. I was about to say, so like that, 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 that feeling when the, uh, the, pro the, your, your dad's producer believes in you more than your dad does. Oh yeah. Um, and, you, and you, and you just, you can't deal with the criticism from your dad. So you just, you just hide your work. You're just like, you can't see it. There's nothing here. Yeah. Like if, if anyone's interested <laughs> in like, uh, in, in, in this movie on like the inner workings of Studio Ghibli, I highly, I highly recommend, uh. I think we all highly recommend the NHK documentary. There's a there's a version of it uh, online with uh, an English version. Um, yeah. it, it's a four part documentary. Like I think it's called Ten Years and uh, Follow, Following yeah. Miyazaki for Ten Years, something like that. It's gonna be linked in the description. <laughs> there's also yeah. a Japanese NHK documentary on, on From Up and Poppy Hill, which we weren't able to find in a, in a translated one version because it's you know just Japanese. But at the very least, the one we did find gives us a lot of insight into the process of. Well, let's just describe how it opens, you know, to give a little bit of a stinger. So you see, like, the team, Goro, surrounded by three other uh, uh, higher-tier uh, uh, animators and character designers and scriptwriters mm -hmm. and so on, all doing their work or, like, putting up their works on the wall as Goro is busily drawing away at the storyboards, trying to figure stuff out. And randomly, a wandering Miyazaki senior pops in. <laughs> just, you know, look at everyone, talk to everyone, be like, oh, what are you doing? Show me this. Oh, this looks good. Nice, 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 nice. Walking around ignoring Goro and like just casually checking in on the boy, seeing if he's doing well without actually intentionally looking at him. It's like such a weird, uh, tense situation because you can tell, like Goro in that moment is like, I'm hiding these storyboards so he doesn't look at them. Because, yeah, he yeah. literally does that. Yeah. <laughs> like he, he puts, puts a big like uh, cardboard plank up uh, against yeah. the, uh, the storyboard wall and it's like, yeah. I don't, if, because if he sees them, then he's gonna. He has a bunch of things to say yeah. about it. I mean, and, and Goro's. Like, yeah, and one of the times we see we have Goro like sitting there, and you know, Mizaki sees all these pictures drawn by like the character designer on the wall, and, and he, he looks at those two two pictures of the main characters, like kind of frowning. He's like, "Nope, these aren't gonna work. Get rid of these. We can't have these." And then it's yeah, just like they're, 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 they're not alive enough. Like, yeah, <laughs> and, and just some some vagary like that. And of yeah. course, like <laughs> you can almost sense that like everyone in the team is like. Well, I mean, the master says so. I mean, I guess you must have a point. <laughs> uh, but, but the thing is, yeah, the relationship yeah. is, is so strained because Goro at one point even says, I know he's going to have something to say and usually his criticisms are good. 
But the problem is, like, if I allow him to walk all over this, that he's gonna make it his project, not, and I want it to be mine. Like, I want it to be yeah, my project. Yeah, that, that's such an, and that, that that's like part of why the documentary is so, uh, like, such a really, just a, a really cool story to to follow a bit because it's just a, an interesting dynamic in that way. Yeah. But there's there, there is, there, yeah, there is a really nice. There is, it's not entirely negative between the two. There is a really nice moment, like after Goro leaves the um. The studio, you know, basically they rent out a a, a, um, a, a little um, office space for him and a few of the other um, people to work, you know, away from Studio Ghibli, so that they can basically so they can get away from from Miyazaki's rampagings, um, and they work on it. Um, then then then, um, Miyaz- then they, they get they get a, they get a picture of the um, of the of the bridge to the um, the main the, the main you know st- um, school building, which they're, they're they're which is like kind of a central location in the film. And drawn by you know, designed by Miyazaki and colored in. He basically like because Miyazaki had been looking for the storyboards because he wanted a, a reference to be able to draw that bridge. But he drew the bridge. It seems without the reference, he just sent it in. Um, and it's like the kind of like like receiving that like that picture is like you know in their their their, their kind of retreat away from him was. I, I thought that was a really nice moment. This kind of like you know offering up. It was yeah. such an indirect way too, because of course Miyazaki came in to criticize like how the main girl and the main boy looked, yeah. and on that painting. The, the striking central feature was the girl briskly walking across the bridge. A shot, by the way, that made it into the movie, I noticed on my rewatches. It, it, it did, yeah. It's like it one did, to yeah, one yeah. in the movie. Um, and uh, this briskly walking pace of the girl kind of gave Goro a little bit of a spark to yeah. redesign and how to redesign the main girl, Umi, to give her more livelihood, more expression, more uh, liveliness, not livelihood. That's that's a different thing. <laughs> yeah, that's <a> very different. <laughs> uh, but, Language you know, is weird. not before we have scenes of Goro, like, on this floor of this rented office office apartment thing, like, just lying on the floor, despairing, <laughs> like, completely crushed. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay, let, 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 this, this episode isn't about the documentary. It's about the movie itself. So let's... <laughs> I mean, it's but important. Yeah. It's important for the movie because as we go along, yeah. like we have this back and forth where Miyazaki is talking to Suzuki, saying like, "I don't know if my boy can do it." And Suzuki's like, "Oh, he can do it. Just you wait for him. I think he can do it." And then he comes around, and that's the that's the narrative arc that I kind of feel like we should portray in regards to Goro as a director of this movie because he came around. He did it. He convinced Miyazaki Senior that yes, this girl is alive now, so we can continue the movie, and that's. The cheery brisk step, which which with which we can approach uh, the movie. <laughs> so yeah, um, just to clarify a little bit of the staff relations, um, I guess we haven't made this clear. Yet. Uh, Goro is the director, but the script, the screenplay is written by Miyazaki. So uh, Miyazaki Senior. Oh. So the cooperation between the two is in so far that Miyazaki Senior wrote like the script, gave it to Goro, said, okay, you do the storyboards now. And Goro was basically left alone to do the storyboards. Oh, well, left alone in quotation marks because, you know, we just described how he wasn't quite left alone. And this is sort of how this movie came about in this cooperation. Uh, Miyazaki, I think, wrote the script together with uh, Keiko Niwa again, who also wrote, helped write the script of Tales from Earth Sea. And that then went into production. Um, <clears throat> so now that we've got this out of the way, um, one of the interesting things, I suppose, as we are in the trivia section still, is that during the production of the movie, the uh, 2011 Tohoku earthquake and tsunami hit Japan. So that's the big, one of the biggest earthquakes recorded in the history of recording earthquakes i think since 1900 was that right i think something around that area which um yeah. you know caused the fukushima reactor meltdown disaster and of course left japan in a uh, shock and devastated many many areas along the coast with the tsunami that joined it and of course the earthquake all about and this included a disruption of the production of the movie as well, um, which I found noteworthy because of, uh, first of all, also how it is prominently featured in the documentary, but also because it led into Miyazaka, Miyazaki Senior questioning, um, or hoping in a press conference that this movie might still speak to a post-earthquake uh, Japanese audience. So one of the interesting things they did during the production is actually they weren't sure they should tell people to come in 
And the only person in the studio who was like, no, you need to come in, you need to work, was, of course, who else? Miyazaki Sr. Oh, Miyazaki. <laughs> yeah. The workhorse himself. Indeed. And so what they did during production is they actually partially worked at night because uh, um, to save, you know, to... Uh, uh, yeah, how the, should the I put pe it? People who... People who needed to work on computers came in yeah. at night to avoid the uh, the, the regular blackouts uh, yeah, yeah. To, to restore the power grid. Exactly, yeah. to, to, so to avoid power grid overload. So there was actually like a really uh, um, working through disaster kind of attitude even at Studio Ghibli as they were continuing to produce this film diligently and make sure it comes out on time still. But yeah, this this work, this is kind of just a, that's just a flavorful, I guess, and tragic, let's say that, uh, background. And I found it really touching in the documentary when all of the involved people in the in the, in, in a press conference, which I then watched in full later on, um, only had a German subtitle, sorry, couldn't share it with you two. <laughs> um, in that press conference, they basically talk about how because they now see that because of the disaster, everyone is working hard, uh, trying to save people, trying to rebuild stuff, trying to, you know, give aid. What we at Studio Ghibli do, they basically said, is we make films. So all we can do is just, you know, work as hard as they do and do what we can do. And and I, I found that uh, a pretty good, strong sentiment of, like, finding some sort of duty and fulfillment in the work you do and contribute to your society. Um, I, I, I think it, uh, it, it speaks to uh, Hayao Miyazaki's, like, tremendous respect for the art of animation and for the work he himself and his staff does. Um, which like feels honestly feels like a contrast between hi him and his son for, for whom animation is like a, a thing that like he wanted to do as a kid decided against and now like sort of landed in. Uh, I, th I think that's just, that, that that's just a thing I like, I, I felt watching the documentary. At the very least, I feel like this time around Goro is more involved in actually wanting to do the project versus Earth C, where basically Suzuki was the yeah. person pushing him into it, try it, try it, do it, you know. And this time around, he's more, I guess, motivated, uh, 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 more like, yes, I, now I actually want to do this job rather than just being told to. Because with Earth C, that was a much, much less uh, certain thing for him. Um, and, I mean, good on him, good on Goro, that, you know, there's, like, this whole touching sort of anecdote thing going on about uh, how Goro kind of had the ideas of being an animator but never told his father and just, you know, kind of repressed that, became a landscape architect, and then, you know, suddenly it's happening after all, which is... It's quite a good story, honestly. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, so, we had... Um, we have now covered the um, production, I, I think. This should lead us finally to start talking actually about what is this movie, what is happening in the movie. So, yeah, first of all, 1980s Chojo manga. Um, in, it seems like it was chosen at first glance a little bit incidentally, right? Like from the anecdote of just having like the niece come over in the cabin reading Shoujo manga. It's like, yeah, I guess this is interesting. How would you adapt this? You know, whatever. Um but there's a lot in this. Yeah. Yeah. Which so the uh, was so the modified. Original, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the original um, manga uh, is set. Uh, it, it was a uh, contemporary. It was set in the uh, start of the eighties, and it was like released uh, nineteen seventy nine to eighty. Now there's a lot of like there's a lot of places online, but like on the English speaking internet at the very least. Uh, that like describe the manga as taking place in 1963, because the uh, the movie adaptation, which is much more widely seen and talked about, sets it in 1963 instead. Indeed. But so we, yeah, yeah, we but had we to do a bit of research. To yeah, we did manage to scrounge up an, an, uh, an interview with the original author that uh, seems to confirm that yes, the original manga does take place in the uh, in the 1980s. In so, indeed, it was yeah. also kind of impossible to find online in a, any translated form, but even untranslated, like a few panels <coughs> we dug up, and that's uh, <coughs> about where we got. Um, <clears throat> the interesting thing is, we have solved the issue of uh, misinformation, of course, on this manga. You all in the audience now know on English Wikipedia it says the manga plays in 1963. No, it does not. 
that is the movie. Everyone is misinformed by the movie, but that's fine. Because really, there were a couple of key plot beats of the manga that were retained. Now, we're going to get into more or kind of what was changed, what was not changed. But let's talk about the basics and locate our setting, right? That is kind yeah. of where the anime differs so strongly from the manga that it is relevant. So first of all, the manga set in a non-distinct coast coastal town with a hill. Goro and Miyazaki Senior immediately, okay, this has to be Yokohama. So they decide this is not just any city, this is Yokohama. And secondly, they decide it needs to be 1963. So let's just first talk a little bit about Yokohama and the year 1963 in Japan to kind of uh, understand where this takes place. And then later we, we will a bit, you know, analyze and, and talk about why they specifically changed the location and the time frame. So, <clears throat> I mean, I, I guess I'm, I'm not the expert on the topic, but I know a couple of things about, you know, 1963 Japan. One of the first things, of course, is that this is understood as a sort of transformative period from the post-war rebuilding Japan into the post-rebuilding, you know, economically uptick, you know, Japan, which develops into what what would we say like develops into like an economic powerhouse on the global stage yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah basically yeah, yeah. and, and th th yeah. that 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 also yeah. like uh the, the movie also like it, it's, it's very explicit about its time period in that um at, at least once they get to uh they, they go to tokyo at one point and the tokyo olympics are coming up the 1964 Il uh, olympics um, yeah, which was which was a pretty big deal. Uh, they, like they, they, Tokyo was supposed to be the host uh, in the year nineteen forty, uh, which uh, got de delayed for ob like first of all they lost that because of the invasion of China. Um, they went to Helsinki, then it got delayed because of you know the whole you know World War thing that kind of gets in the way of you know the whole international cooperation thing, um, and. Then so now finally, uh, decades after the um, uh, after the war, uh, Tokyo once again gets to uh, be uh, the host uh, as as the first Asian uh, country to to be so, and that was like a really big deal because like it 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 really was like a symbol of Japan like becoming part of the international community as as one of the like big Western uh, powers and. It was a huge, huge, um, like project to modernize Tokyo properly uh, before the uh, you know before the guests arrived. So, so um, um, well, 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 the external elements of the Olympics were definitely one important thing. There was there's also very much a kind of reflection over the last um, twenty years of Japanese history, the post the, the post war era, right? Like, say, well, if you take the um, the, um, the the torchbearer. For the Olympics, um, they, they, oh, they yeah. were named. They, they were known as the, the Adam Boy, and they, they found the most beautiful boy they could they could they could find. Right, who was born on the day of, or within a few days of the um, the the, um, the bombing in Hiroshima, um, and um, within um, um, within a few dozen kilometers of the city center. Um, so like, but like this person was like you know physically fit and just like there were there were I think the description is like five foot nine and one hundred and forty pounds. So like this kind of like absurdly like skinny and like you know obsessed this like the obsession of like the, the the form of like you know japan is this kind of like we're emerging we're proud of our image now right where like if you think of like japan in the 50s kind of image of itself as this kind of poor starving country um um and i and, and, and you can see and you see this in, in so many different elements of how japan conceived of you know themselves in the 1964 um, olympics um um so yeah, we have a side um, yeah. guys of it is now yeah. going upwards. Japan, or at least presents itself as we are emerging. We are now, you know, stepping into the future. We want to have this big event of the Tokyo Olympics, which on the surface, really fancy. Uh, uh, I guess you shared earlier, uh, under the surface, literally under the surface, wasn't quite as fancy with, uh, you know, prop, uh, bad infrastructure and shitstorms literally filling the streets. <laughs> Something like that. You see, you see, um, there was, there was a, yeah, there was, there was, there was Tokyo it advertised itself as, um, as, um, Kokusai Toshi, as an in the international city, but often people called it, um, um, 
Kusai Toshi, or the smelly city, or the <laughs> Unkosa, Unkokusai Toshi, or the city smelling of poop. Because, like, basically what they did in their big construction projects is, is they just, in, instead of, like, you know, modernizing the sewage systems and the stuff, they just built big concrete slabs over the top of them. Um <laughs> So the pe- wow. people didn't have to see them and, and the like, and they just, they, and they, 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 they really modernized the sewage in the Olympic village, but in the rest of the city, they, they really did not put the, take the time. So this kind of like covering up of the past Japan is that I feel like a really, really important element of, you know, that's a of, really of, strong symbol. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a symbol. The wow. movie has in it. It doesn't have the smelly city, but I think no. this sentiment is all over the entire movie, which is yeah, kind of what definitely. we are, why we're kind of going into this novel historical context. Yeah, and, and it's important because there's there's one more really important historical event that kind of frames the movie on the other side. In 1960, there was um there was the renewal of the um of the of the security treaty between the U.S. and um and 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 um and Japan, and this treaty was like you know the original treaty was extremely one sided of course because it was like a post war treaty it was, yeah it's it was basically you based. you are an american uh, military base now basically, basically thank you very yes. much and and the 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 idea of the, like the renegotiation of the treaty was to kind of um recenter it as a more like a us Japan, japanese alliance but this had this, like, a lot of people took issue with this especially the students of the country because um, they wanted they well, they didn't want anything to do with you know U.S. like hegemony in you know East Asia. They wanted to be a completely neutral country in the Cold War, and that was that was generally the um the um the um the the idea in Japan. This leads to these to these enormous protests. Um, um, you know, lots of people die in these protests. Um, and yeah, people, people, I, people, I, I believe, like at least according to Wikipedia, it's the biggest protest movement in Japanese history. Yes, correct. Yes. Um, and it was, it, you know, and, and, and it, and it was, it was, um, and it was all focused kind of on the prime minister. The prime minister's name was, um, 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 sorry, I'm, I'm blanking. Um, um, Kishi, um, Nobusuke was the name of the prime minister. And, um, he's very notable because he was a, he was a part, he was a class A war criminal. He was someone who was supposed to be executed after World War II, but wasn't because the U.S., you know, basically stopped doing that partway through because they wanted to use those people to help rule the country. And so like he kind of became like a symbol for like the kind of past of Japan, right? And so like these kind of all these all these like protests against the um the um the security treaty were almost more about kind of trying to cleanse themselves of this kind of um of this past and you know and so this kind of cleansing of the past and acceptance of the future framing of, of those these, these two major events i feel like this entire film kind of plays within those those boundaries and i think that's why it's set in 19 so yeah to kind quick, of uh, quick question thundy yeah. um so so largest protest movement in japanese history fighting against this treaty uh did it work um they got they they they, they deposed they, they deposed um, um um kishi but they did not stop the treaty from going through um, hmm Curious. Um, okay. I'm, like, what Kishi did was he had basically removed all his opposition with police forces, so he could vote. So they could vote on the issue on, on a post. Damn. That's, yeah. That's that's really fucked up. Um, yeah, but but yeah. I guess to summarize sort of the sentiment, right? It is a Japan right now struggling, or at least interested in how it will deal with its historic legacy and how it will present itself going forward in many yeah. different ways, like the students opposing a sort of. Um, continuation of power of the war criminals um the presentation to the outside world as an international japan which can shine in like some let's call it fake glory because you know literally putting concrete slabs across the sewers to like hide them is pretty telling here and you know you have the old i suppose fascists trying to establish like national in, uh, sovereignty again and you have all these different factions trying to I guess codify what the Japanese past meant and what the Japanese future is gonna be look gonna look like. Yeah, and and in terms of the film, like it 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 draws on this idea, at least this conception of the '60s, as like the protests, because like at the start of the '60s and in the late '60s, we also have like uh, the, the, uh, big student protests um, that that like what was like a worldwide phenomenon, but like also hit Japan pretty hard. Um, so like. The, the film from up on Poppy Hill like also has that element um, where in this case the uh, the students at the uh, at the high school um, are like having a big fight over this uh, culture building 
on on the campus where like a bunch of clubs are hang out and it's old and dilapidated and just like just just a place where like girls don't want to go there kind of <laughs> kind of messy um the and Latin it's, it's, it's going, yeah so it's yeah. it's about to be like uh torn down to build a new cooler building because that's that's the thing for for Japan and there's a like little student movement going on, on the, in the high school to uh like uh, to protest this to uh, uh to stop it from be, uh, getting removed and that's like a, a like fully like half of the plot of the movie is about that um but like but like interestingly where the where the, the big protest movements of the 60s were like uh progressive or or, or leftist or, or at least like anti-imperialist in nature um the big movement we're meant to like be on the side of in this movie is like kind of, it's conservative like they're all about we have to preserve this thing from the past because there's like something worth preserving there and we shouldn't just t- tear it tear it down and build something else to be clear to be clear to be clear this idea of like conserving the past is versus that that that's not really the, your ideas of the ideas of like conservatism like in that regard don't really map super well the conservatism is better described as kind of like a, of that time it's as more like a neoliberalism um, with mm. you know, kind of fascist, like the militarist leanings, right? So like, the, like the whole giant Tokyo building projects were very much conservative in nature. Um, yeah. In terms so of the parties they were. This supporting. is what we have to understand here, right? Like the, uh, I, this is why I disagree that the student protest in this movie is kind of conservative. It is, I think, the opposite. No, first of all, first textual evidence is in the debate they have the students internally over whether or not the Latin Quarter should be gotten rid of to have built a new one. 80% of the students agree there should be a new one. But the ones who resist this and are loud and say, uh, this is not true democracy, you're oppressing the minority, you are just like the old conservatives in our government, and and they are being called anarchists. This is like a textual evidence, but even like subtextually. Um, If we take like the Tokyo Olympics, right, what a progressive, let's say, a leftist or whatever, a a non-conservative view of history would want is that you do not just simply put concrete slabs of the old sewer system to present a new clean image of Japan, but instead that you deal with your history. And dealing with your history can, in this case of the Latin Quarter, consist in, you know, retaining the culture, retaining some culture, you know, this is like intellectual Western clubs, right? Really important. This is not like some old fascist right, reading right, group right. that reads <laughs> classic literature from like uh, uh, the Meiji era. This is yeah, they yeah, read. There's, there's like, a philosophy yeah. club. There's a uh, the, the, there's uh, astronomy see, like, club, ra- archaeology yeah, clubs. Yeah, we see like a, a radio club contacting. Uh, I, we presume like the Americans, like speaking saying, English. Like this is Japanese high school. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah. So that that's actually a pretty good point. So the the whole notion here is that you do not simply engage in this blind project of modernism of simply present a new Japanese face, but instead you deal with your history in a responsible way, which I think is uh, the metaphor this movie uses as they try to renovate and make the Latin Quarter pretty again uh, to continue to house all these eccentric clubs and their you know radical ideas. All right, you, that, that that's actually pretty fair. Like, like I, I think I might have been a bit too literal in, than in, in my idea of like conservatism, as in they wish to conserve the old, um, be, uh, be because it's clearly like more complicated than that. Yeah, exactly. This is, by the way, something I think a couple of people trip up in terms of like I guess. Th- uh, theory of history or philosophy of history it is that modernism the project to modernize is just as much a fascist project as it is a communist or whatever progressive project right because all the radical political movements of the 20th century have been obsessed with the idea of constructing a new reich a new empire a new face of the world of modernizing every little bit and that is entirely politically neutral in quotation marks in the sense that this project has been used by every political side and what is being opposed here in a way is sort of from a i don't want to call it postmodern, but a more critical historical lens we are opposing the idea of uh, simply direct modernism which is really important as we move and at least in the, uh, we're getting really philosophical now, but like in theoretical approaches to history, philosophical approaches to history, often the 60s, the post-World War II era is understood as the era where we transition from modernity into post-modernity, which is the era in which the grand narratives of make it new 
lose credibility and are criticized in discourses more and more because of the gr tragic failures uh, that we've seen in World War II and with the, you know, Stalinist Russian communist projects and so on. Um, yeah, although, like, it, it feels like Japan is a bit behind the curve on that thing. Uh, like, uh, we uh, read an uh, ac academic uh, article on, like, the idea of post-war in, uh, in, in Japan, how, like, bas basically they described the uh um they, they they just described the time they were in as a post-war way into like the, the the 60s like almost up until like the the, the 80s and, and and the uh and and the death of uh, emperor hirohito they, they they were in a p perpetual like rhetorical uh collective state of we are in the post-war we are becoming modern um and like the idea of like being post post war was like it took a while for that to to set in yeah definitely and this is sort of the transformative moment we are bearing witness to from this perspective right um there's this interesting paper also that thundi brought to the table about veterans in japan trying to think about what their position and role in terms of processing history in society is at this point do we bring up the experiences of the war and basically pull down everyone, make everyone feel bad about it? Or do we just keep quiet even though we want to talk about what happened? Like this spirit of, okay, what do we do with the past? How do we process the past? Yeah. Is how the post-war era could carry on into the 60s, even 20 years later. Yeah, we, and, and that the, carries the, 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 into the, the second, um, the, the, the other half of the movie, which is the uh, the romance mm -hmm. plot and the plot of... Uh, uh, the main character's story. Uh, Umi uh, is her name. She's a sweet, diligent, polite uh, girl. Uh, her father died in, um, uh, in 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 the war, which in the Korean uh, I, War. I yeah, in the K Korean War uh, from a from a uh, from a uh, a mine, um, uh, as, uh, you know, an, an undersea mine. Uh, he was a sailor and. Uh, and her, uh, her mother is oh, a oh, professor. Oh, oh, important I don't comment is that the Korean War, the the a uh, couple of Japanese landing ships were pulled in by the U.S. into the Korean War. I think that's a yeah uh, a significant uh, yeah. Well, in, in the Japanese, generally their um their merchant fleet was like their 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 commercial like like ships were all used by the U.S. in the war. Right. There was actually there was there was, re there was relatively significant Japanese involvement in in both Korean and Vietnamese wars. And I right, guess right. this is also good point to just mention uh you were just describing kind of who our characters are but before we like really move into tying it all together when we talk about the narrative oh, here, there's an elephant in the room we just earlier said that um the manga was set in the 80s yet we only talked about how all these important 60s elements factor into the plot into all the things that happen in the in the movie into all the themes including the korean war which wouldn't work because you know in the 80s there was no korean war in the in the near past um this movie is overloaded with anachronisms and like yeah because the decision to transplant all of its narrative into the 60s was a very deliberate one i mean from one hand uh, uh goro miyazaki kind of commented on it that um they wanted to create a sense of historicity in line with the themes of the movie, which really are concerned with memory and so on. He felt that the idea of historicity, of, you know, engaging with history, of looking at history and understanding history, is better understood in a movie that actually depicts a time period which is much further away than the 80s, where to the consciousness in 2010, which would be, you know, the 60s, which are at that point quite far away, to the point that Goro wasn't even alive at the time this movie plays. You know, Goro didn't even grow up in the 60s. Indeed, that was the generation his father, Miyazaki, a senior, grew up in and was, I mean, a young man during already because, you know, he, he's ancient, but, you know, ancient <laughs> wisdom and everything. Um, but that's such an interesting sort of point of how you uh, change the entire meaning of the text of the, of the manga by just putting it back a few decades yeah, into this very decisive historical moment, which is also, I guess, the main reason you focus so much on the historical background, because... And it's, 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 yeah, and it's, it's, it's especially funny to think about, like, we're thinking, we're taking a move we made in 20, 20, 20, uh, 2011, uh, you know, about 
you know, adapting a manga from, you know, from, from 1980, depicting a time from the 60s about people thinking about the 40s. So it's like... <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, and it looks like yeah. it takes place in the like mid-50s, right? Uh, like, I, I, I watched the movie and I'm looking for the sign, like, like the moment where, like, an audience would realize, oh, this is obviously the 60s. And, like, I'm not sure when that moment arrives exactly. Okay. So yeah, in the in, in the nineteen fifties, there became this, these 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 three regalia that you know all people were supposed to want to to achieve, which were owning a a rice maker, a TV, and a washing machine. Right um, in the fifties, that was not attainable for most people because those were expensive, and Japan was very very poor. Um, but by the sixties, that became like basically your marks of a middle class home was was having those three things, and um, and most people had these were able to achieve that kind of that kind of of you know relative luxury um, compared to the you know the, like really intensity of of the um uh, the, the the serious you know the intensity that came associated with you know the, the time before sorry um but um what's really interesting is she doesn't have a a rice cooker like she, you see we have we have a TV um that they have um we, we never shown whether she they have a washing machine or not um and then they mentioned drying their clothes after being washed so i assume they have a washing machine but they don't have a rice a rice, a rice cooker they 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 they, yeah, they, they use they have the, an old school yeah. uh, gas thing yeah and I'm a, it's very interesting for i think a lot of reasons this this kind of inclusion of this this this, this specific anachronism right cuz yeah um and th and that's like in the opening scene like the opening scene is we see uh, umi's morning routine as she get is the one earliest to get up she uh she's sort of taking care of her her, her mom's boarding house, um like getting breakfast ready, uh, stuff like that. So we see like this everyday routine gets established, and like this would be the moment where you show, oh look, it's the sixties. There's a rice cooker, but there isn't. That was pretty interesting. Um, yeah. So and uh, my little pet theory about this was that. You know, we know Goro was a big fan of Takahata's work, and Takahata used uh, uh, one of those mm. similar-looking rice cookers, uh, these these pot rice cooker ones with a wooden lid, in uh, uh, *Grave of the Fireflies* very prom prominently. And Goro, not having grown up doing that time period, maybe just put a different rice cooker in. But I still find the reading of, you know, this household for some reason deviates substantially yeah. from what would be normal at that time. Uh, in an interesting observation. I mean, where are you going with that observation? You know, I also think it's interesting. It's, we take we, we take, take the household like as a space, right? It's like it's kind of this almost feminist, you know, conjecture of women of all types, you know, working together. You know, yeah, in this got, boarding getting, house, which yeah. features uh, in which only women. I think one boy one little brother, there, yeah. her, 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 a little brother, little brother there, who yeah. has no role in this movie whatsoever. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, he's just there to be annoying a couple but times. But like <laughs> only women live in this boarding house. Aside yeah. from that, and we have like an artist, we have a doctor, and you know, all sorts of things. And noteworthy, one of the deviations from the manga is the doctor used to be a man. And now it's not a man, now it's a woman. Um, yeah, also yeah. Uh, her mother used to be a photographer in the original. Yeah. But now she's like a professor who's like away, you know, teaching, yeah. I, I, I think it's like some sort of English studies. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, but as, as, as you were saying, it's like a feminist space almost. And I kind of yeah. can kind of see yeah. where you're going, it, like because sixties feminism it, had this whole notion of like the washing machine as a liberator of the woman in the house, because now like the work can be done by something else yeah. by a machine. Um, we 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 have the space of the of, of the kitchen, right, being our main character space, which is strange. We have this boarding house. You, you, you kind of like you know traditionally assume the space of the kitchen is is the space of the woman, but in the, in this boarding house, we've already like turned that on its head. Like we have all these professional women, or we've an artist. We have all these people just like, occupying all roles in society, which also is you know pretty anachronistic in itself. It feels more like an eighties idea of feminism and women's liberation, but that's the you know <laughs> that's that's just another thing to note it. But um. But it's interesting how our character in that space is she 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 does the, the cooking she does all those elements and and the one regalia that there seem to be missing is the one that she's involved with so she has this kind of connection to the um to the past in some way through the you know this this rice cooker and her her role and we can take that further if we want to start talking about you know her her kind of her daily role in society um, right um, like do you want to her her most common attribute. Uh, the thing we know her for and that people in the, in the beginning of the movie start knowing her for is she's the girl who raises the flags because their boarding house is on a hill 
and that hill has a little flag post, and every morning she raises flags with like symbols. Yeah, these on sig- it. signal flags, signal to, flags, uh, yeah. to, to signal the ships. Indeed, um, and yeah. that is because she has been told to, you know, I- as a kid, that you know what these signals mean, and that if she just keeps signaling for her father, her father who was deceased in the Korean War might one day return. And I think, Thunny, you had a great observation about this, how this kind of relates to the traditional role of the war widow. Yeah, so um, in Japan, we have this idea of the, of, the, of the wives of the honorable spirits of the dead, right? Where um, um, during, 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 during World War II, um, there was like both an economic incentive um, because they would, the government would give money to war widows, but also this kind of social incentive for like women, to, the, the women to like kind of like perceived as you know, once your 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 soldiers died, and a lot of people got married right before the war because you know that's how it worked. Um, and had to, to kind of remain kind of as a bride to that dead soldier. Um, 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 and I mean, this of course is not everyone wanted this. Like you, you know, like there's there was a, of course even during the World War II, there were screams of you know murder and I want my 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 husband back and that kind of thing. You know, at like Yasukuni Shrine or where where the war. Where, where the war dead were um, enshrined. But this kind of narrative was really important. And especially like in the post-war era, we kind of get this kind of like um, 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 conflict between the general war bereavement moves and the f- more, which are read, usually run by older men um, and the uh, and these smaller, more locally run, um, um, almost feminist, um, 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 widow-led war bereavement groups, which were read, led usually by women in their 20s and 30s, you know, that kind of gave like these these kinds of identities and of, of war widows not as wise but as um as, as you know as people as humans as people you know in society who've lost their means and are trying to you know survive in some way but as the 40s and 50s went on those kind of groups got rolled into the more generalized war bereavement groups and we kind of like again we erase the past we erase what the reality of these people are and then present them as this kind of hyper aestheticized image of the women who is the 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 wife of the of, of the of the dead husband and the image of our main character you know raising her flags for her dead father kind of echoes that 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 sentiment right i mean it's not you know exact she's not she, she she's not she's not a wife of her father of course but she kind of she, i mean but she kind of functions as a wife like she, her mother's not there she cooks the meals she works with the old fashioned um rice rice pot and she every day she raises the flags for, you know, send to send messages to her passed away father. Like she, in all like, like ways, functions like um, symbolically identical to that of the traditional idea of the, the, the you know the, the wife of wife of the dead spirit. Which further wait, wait, kind wait, of gets. Hang on. Yeah, go on. Hang on. You're telling me that a Goro Miyazaki movie ha- deals with daddy issues. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, it awesome. really fucking does because you know, <laughs> and as I was about to go into, you know, it connects to uh, uh, the flags are seen by our other main character, which is the boy Shun, and Shun just so happens to uh, be the the spitting image of uh, uh, Umi's father, apparently. And there's even in the plot uh, for a, a, a long period the confusion of whether or not. Uh, Umi's father is also the father of Shun. There's like a lot of incest fantasy, you know, you, you, you could project into those parts. And <laughs> yeah, then, yeah, <laughs> like, like the, the two, um, yeah, the, the two, the two have a, like a blossoming, blossoming romance uh, as uh, as Shun is kind of like the leader of this student movement to preserve the uh, uh, the culture building, the Latin Quarter, yeah. and she sort sort of uh, inadvertently like gets involved with it and gets inspired by it and starts having a crush on him, and he like, has a crush on her, and it's really sweet. And then, like, when when he's like visiting um, her place, she shows him a picture of of, uh, of her dad with with his uh, like an old black and white photo, photo with like uh, his war buddies. And turns out, Shun knows that picture actually, uh, and he has been told at least that he, that his biological father was Umi's father, and that he like got adopted by his current parents. Yeah, which uh, like, yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and interesting when they find that out. Like he, like he's like, oh no, we can't, we can't, we we can't be, you know, you have to forget our feelings for each other. But she doesn't seem to mind, right? Like she's already <laughs> internalized her role as as the wife okay. of the war dead. So she doesn't. She's like, yeah, of course, of course, you're my you're my father, right? <laughs> <laughs> but um, before we uh, dig into the Romans aspect a little bit further, um, I I I just find it noteworthy that like her 
in the beginning of the movie, raising her flags towards the ocean, kind of signaling to the lost father. She finds uh, someone who re he who reacts to the flags, which is Shun, and sort of the relationship to Shun transforms her in such a way that by the end of the movie, instead of raising her flags a flag to the past, uh, to a lost father, she signals her flags to, at least that's my reading, to a future, because, and this is why I bring it up, uh, I haven't really explained yet uh, about, we talked a lot about the time period, we haven't talked a lot about Yokohama, so what we need to understand is, Goro gave like an interview on it, which was also one of the German Blu-ray features, which I have not uh, been able to provide for you all, um, but there he talks about specifically the setting of Yokohama and he talks about how he growing up as a boy, uh, you know, born in the 60s, um, grew up to mysticize Yokohama as this place which is sort of Japan's connection to the world. Because, you know, Japan has a lot of harbors, but somehow the idea, the image of Yokohama as the international harbor stuck around. Not in, in small part owed to the fact that Yokohama has all the had all the big embassies, like the American embassy and all these like big important buildings that kind of connected yeah, Yokohama yeah, yeah. to the world. It's also like very much the like a lot of people see it as almost like the commercial, like like if you want to like you, like if you live in Tokyo, you go, you want to go shopping, you know, you want to access, you know, the West, so like all these different like like international cultures. You go to Yokohama, Indeed. like that's the place. For those kind of things. And the same way, Tokyo. Yokohama was also the place where a lot of Western influence arrived, like Western architecture, yeah. Western buildings, yeah, Western people in immigrating. Um, all of those things arrived in Yokohama. So in the in the in one place, like we have established, nineteen sixty three as a liminal time period of transformation of reevaluating the past. We now have also the place of Yokohama, which is a liminal space, the gate to Japan, but also the gate to the world. So it goes in both directions. It is the the meeting point of Western influences and Japanese influences. And this is yeah. exactly how Goro describes this. He sees yeah. Yokohama as basically the symbol of rebuilding Japan in this movie. As and, and, and you notice at the very beginning of the film, right, where we first where she first raised the flags, and you don't see what she's raising the flags to. To you, to, to the, your mind, you see her raising the flags, and you see an image of, you know, basically an almost empty sea, and then you see the space outwards. And you like, and because you know you're in Yokohama, you're like, oh, I'm looking, I'm looking out eastward. I'm looking, where am I looking? I'm looking across the sea to America. I'm looking to the west, right? You, you don't even, you, before you even have the context of the father brought into the film, Yokohama's already the idea of raising your flag to the um to to to, to the um to to the world to the, like you know <laughs> the outside is, is already there and yeah. it's later when we get the extra contextualization of you know the war past that we then start having to question that thing even though that's the thing that we were looking at initially with. Well, I, we we already had the idea of like at least a missing loved one from the uh f from the morning routine sequence. Uh, b b because like one of the things she does is she sets a glass of water by a little uh, little picture. I I'm not sure if I can call it a shrine in the traditional sense, but like at the very least, like it's pretty clear that it's a person. That a no black and white p photo of a person that like is being honored with flowers and well, stuff. That's uh, I told I totally missed that scene because I, I I didn't even know that she had a flower no, there. It's, until it's a later. brief detail, I, yeah. but like it's part of like I, I <laughs> the scene think, like, where the she changes sequence... the glass of water to me was like like how you have like an old jug of water standing around the house so people can like pour some water. Yeah, you know? that's how I read yeah. that scene. That's how I that's how I read that as well. <laughs> okay, well I, uh, yeah. that's not how I read it. I I just think <laughs> that like the opening sequence of the film is like one of the best parts of it because like it's it's like. Uh, it's completely silent. It's really good at setting the tone. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has music. Uh, establishing the setting and establishing the main character and her everyday life. Yeah, it has and, music. And the more it we has, learn... It has a song yeah, about breakfast. And the music is really nice. Yeah. <laughs> a song about breakfast yeah. with, a, with a really, like, breathy uh, female vocals. It's just, yeah. Ah, yeah. It's it's time for, for, for breakfast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this is also where really, we encounter really Umi as like uh, the character of the domestic sphere, right? The 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 yeah. image of, I guess, like yeah, not yeah. just the widow, but like the motherly figure as well arrives there because we have this really, uh, uh, let's say, whole wholesome, I guess, song about a wholesome breakfast, which has like all these sizzling eggs and stuff like that being uh, being prepared and the rice and the natto and everything. Uh, as she's literally preparing breakfast for everyone in the house. Uh, and you see all these old appliances as she like goes through the routines. And I, I feel like these routines, these interactions like everyday objects are quite common for her character and her characterization. Because, you know, she doesn't have much of a personality in, in general, but... Uh... <laughs> 
<laughs> we'll get to that. Yeah, we'll get to that. But we, uh, we understand her certainly through these interactions. And this is kind of the thing that in the course of the movie, at least in my read, about her becomes uh, 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 something that will be transformed. Because I feel one of the things... I, this is a common anime trope, right? The absent parents. Uh, oftentimes absent fathers, like you have typically in it, it's, Shonen. It's a, it's a common storytelling trope because it's like when, when if you want something people can relate to you start with family that's the old adage but there's like, like there's everyone like a, has some relationship to that or they have a relation to it in that they don't have one but it's like also everyone has, can relate somehow an absolute epidemic in anime like this trope mm. of the absent <laughs> father i mean the most blatant on the nose reading is the absent father well you know during goro's childhood miyazaki senior was never much at home because he was busy becoming the most successful and greatest anime director of all time um this of course can be read as part of why the story might uh, have turned out the way it did but i read it even in a little bit of a different way because the father often represents as a shorthand, it's like a sort of generic symbol even, often represents more than the literal, you know, your literal father. It also represents the world, the nation, let's say, the safety, the, the, the structure and safety of, you know, reality. I, I guess these are very broad claims. But, like, the father is supposed to, in the traditional, you know, patriarchal family structure, be the one that's provide stability and security to the family, right? So the image of the absent father cannot but always invoke the sense of an instable world, right? Uh, uh, even if that's not necessarily the case, which is, however, where Umi is stuck at the beginning of the movie, right? The world without the father and her life is structured around mourning, in the morning, mourning in the morning, you know, um, with raising the flags, whereas um, gradually... She become she works through the absent parents, first of all, in a crucial scene, I find, because her mother returns. Her mother, who is an assistant professor, who basically expressed it, it was thanks to your father that I was able to go about my education and have this position. I'm really thankful. And this is the moment where I think we transform from the mourning just for the absent father and the instability of the world into an appreciation of, you know, the world that was able to shape you and make you into who you are and the sacrifices of the people who did it. And in that moment, and after having been inoculated into the student movement, basically, she changes her mind, changes her ways, and then starts, In at least I interpret the flag very differently by the end, when she raises it again, beaming brightly, her face smiling. Uh, and yes, side, side note, about about that scene, um, so I, 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 I think the, the whole, like, uh, Umi's uh, in, internal journey is is, is is sort of like it it has some pretty like pretty good emotional moments uh like when when she finally sees her mother again but even before that there's a dream sequence um where first we like see her like uh like walking around crying in this dreamy scene that oh, yeah. is really reminiscent of uh, only yesterday you know speaking of is is like a hara inspiration speaking of 60s um but uh, but but then like she has this false awakening and it turns out oh, her mother's home and it's like, yeah, you're home. And she's like, oh, I've always been here. And that's when we realize, oh, oh, wait. And her Indeed. dad is there. And there's there, there's this like really nice, uh, like bright sunlight streaming in. And as she wakes up from it, like it's actually like pretty like gray and uh, and, and dreary. You know, um, you're so right, that lighting, That specific lighting returns at the end of the movie when she raises that flag for the final time. Indeed, you're even with yeah. her, even with her father absent, like she, she seems to have found that like that spark. You know, which is, you know, again, yeah. that, that's one of the better like directorial choice. Uh, I've, like, I've been touches in the movie. You know, I don't know why I've been dancing around the psychoanalytic reading because what I said about the father is a psychoanalytic reading. If we literally have a dream to interpret in the film. <laughs> And you just did it for me, Plato. Thank you very much. I think that that's like the perfect encapsulation of exactly what I mean, right? The, you know, you have like this dream vividly conjuring images of like her desires, her wishes to have this, like this imagined sublime stable world with like the father and the mother at home. And that's like how the family is supposed to be structured. And she awakes from that and she finds the same sunlight that was associated with the stable world with the father in that ocean that now represents the world. As we match cut to the painting 
as we said, there's an artist uh, lady living in the same boarding house and she's painting. What is she painting? She's painting like a Jackson Pollock, like ocean of colors. Uh, in I which... think it's mostly red as in poppies. Uh, there's no, it's all kinds of colors. It's wild. I mean, there's some, there's a lot of red in there, but it's like really yeah, the, 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 colorful uh, splotches everywhere. I, I, and... I read that as like representing like a uh, feel of poppies, but like again, it's it's pretty like, it's pretty abstract in that way. So for me, it was like just abstractly an ocean of colors, and in that ocean of colors, you could see a ship raising the flags that Umi also raised. Right, the ship raising the flags that Umi also raised. That is Shun's uh, ship. Which, uh, because Shun replied to the signal flags by also raising the flags on the ship of his of, of his father, who he was like comping yeah, every which, morning, which she couldn't see yeah. from the level of like raising the flags, but you could see from upstairs, which is like a, a pretty like you know, oh, you just need like like a different from a different perspective, and you can you can see like that that yeah. you are being heard and stuff Indeed. like that. And <laughs> what this for me represents is the ship is leaving or is like traveling the harbor that is the gate to the world. So the sea is the world. The ship that is traveling is, it is the future. You know, as we match cut from uh, uh, Umi seeing, like raising her flag at the end of the movie into the painting, what we're clearly expressing is not that, and and I, I will fight anyone who says it, it is not that Shun is simply just a replacement father figure that brings stability to her world. It is simply that she is facing the future and this is just a person that helped her see the future. You know, yeah, I think I think that that honestly like is a is a good way to connect this to this part of the film to the you know the the back 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 to the student part of the film, which we didn't go too depth much into depth. Yeah, in we should part. we definitely um, still should because if, if we if we take this idea right of her raising the, the flag you know ritualistically every day for her father, and that's kind of just almost like an empty signifier. It's just her there's there's there's, there's a thing. You know, there's you know the, 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 like there there's this there's this object, this like you know sublime you know um you know like tragedy it's also a refusal to his, give yeah. up on the past right yeah. it's a refusal but, to yeah. accept the father yeah. is dead well, well it, it, I, I don't think either is they give you they're both different ways of looking at the past right yeah we have because because shun represents the father in a way but that's but they're different ways of looking at it right in one way i'm just ritualistically raising my flag in a meaningless way in the other way not, not meaningless but in like a you know i, I mean it is meaningless it's in the, in the, in the, you know, in the you know sound full of sound and fury signifying nothing that kind of way um it's just, it's just, kind of, it's kind of a ritual you do because that's my role in society. That's my role as a war widow. But when she raises the flag to later to, you know, now more to the world and more to Shun, Shun is, is a father replacement in that regard. But she knows that he responds. So now she has a dialogue with Shun, with her feelings, with her past. Right. So we're not not dealing with the past anymore. We are just negotiating it in now a thoughtful way. Which this is yeah. why I think it's important to then shift over to. To, to, to the students because... Um, yeah, just, just a I brief think... note on this, right? Like Shun's connection to the past is clearly in the movie, not just because of his activism for the um, um, Latin Quarter, which we will now get into, and, and I'll let you talk more on that, but also because like literally Shun meeting her is the inciting moment of them together finding out, wait, this photo this might be our dad. Like, it might be the yeah. dad of both of us. And they start the investigating this question and <laughs> dealing properly with the past incited by Shun yeah, and, inter and Umi meeting. Interrogating it. Interrogating yeah, which, the past. Which, is, uh, which, lucky for them, uh, when once they, like, like once the, the mother character re returns and, uh, and, and Umi is like, okay, I need to ask you this. Finally, someone who can give a straight answer because Shun's dad wasn't really forthcoming about it. Um... She explains that, like, actually, Shun was like a uh, an orphaned kid. Yeah, war orphan, that, basically. Yeah, but a war orphan that uh, that Umi's dad like uh, d d took in and like wrote in the pa wrote the like signed the papers that yes, this is my kid because otherwise they would end up in an orphanage, which apparently was like a thing that like soldiers generally did uh, around that time with the uh, with the war, and. Uh, and, and and so he 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 got that kid and, and and like this is uh we I had to tell him it, it was mine and she's like oh okay but then because like then he had to go out to war and she was like pregnant with her studies he decided to like give it to his other friend and that's why like everyone thought including Shun that Shun was Umi's yeah. brother but it turned out he wasn't but just so a quick comment. Is cool. I find this okay. is really significant in like how 
uh, you almost like structured it like 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 sort of like the layers of absurdity of how many layers of separation there are. But I think that's like a really really good observation as well, because as we talk about how did it come about that this kid was so abandoned, basically so orphaned, we talk about multiple things. We talk about this: his father died in the war, his mother died in childbirth, and was basically left alone. His relatives died to the atomic bomb. Um, we bring up Hiroshima, um, and all of these these things, these realities, these tragedies of war lead to a loss of past in a way as well, in the literal sense of family members disappearing without a trace, family members not being there anymore to tell their stories, to give this connection to where did you come from and, you know, what what is the past? And I feel like this process of gradually unraveling an uncertain past feeds centrally into why we have this let's say, incest scare, this motif in there. Because it brings about anxiety. You know, your love interest, it's all going well, we're, we're connecting somehow, but somehow, like, something in our past ties us together. And, you know, the anxiety that the love, the stability that is seemingly found will be taken away by, you know, the past coming after us in some, you know, obscure way, which in this case would be incest, uh, lingers. So the desire to uncover the past, to understand where you stand, where your future will be going, is central to this movie. And the way his past, Shun's past especially, is extremely confused and hard to trace, and nobody really seems to know anything, I guess feeds into how I think like the narrative of history just has gaping holes when it comes to war, when it comes to the tragedies that literally like tear holes into the continuity of families. I have some more readings on the incest thing, but I want to get to them after we go through the, the student movement. Um, just putting a pin in that. But I, I do, I, I do, to, to get to the student, I, I, I want to start, like, before we talk about anything, I want to do another, another another term I think is important to, you know, to reckon with, which is that of the senso sekinin, um, or the, basically, or basically, um, um, war responsibility. Um, and it was really important as a concept in Japan because um, it was basically how the war wanted to be remembered, it was in the way that, you know, um, um, Umi remembered her father, right? It's just supposed to kind of be a, um, there's, there's, there's the, it, was, it was either just, oh, we need to, you know, blindly worship our, you know, kind of dead, um, our, our, our dead family, you know, the war, the, the war dead, or, um, oh, I'm a victim. I, I just, I, every, everything, you know, my, my existence is, 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 is that of victimhood. I, I was bombed by the Americans and so on, right? So, like, this kind of concept was very, you know, very anti-conservative in that it's like saying that, no, we have a lot of war history that we have to navigate through and understand as a society so we can then appreciate it and, you know, make sure something like that doesn't happen again, right? Um, this was especially important in the student movements when so many ex-fascist um, leaders of Japan during the war became, became high members of, you know, parliament, right? Like, like, Ishii, um, um, it was okay. Um, um. I yeah, always we, forget we, his name. I'm so bad with his name. Um, we, we, no, we, we, mentioned, um, we, we discussed a bit of this like idea of victims' history in the episode about uh, Grave of the Fireflies, yes. which like which sort of like plays into some of it, but but uh, avoids like uh, like d doesn't shy away from like the like responsibility of the Japanese people and stuff. Yeah. And we talk um, a lot about that next episode. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. Oh boy, will we? Um, but I think this, this idea is really important for um, the student movement because that's what we. This is how we frame these students, right? One of the first times we see the students in, in like you know, in, um, what is it? This is one. It's not, it's not like neither. This is one, not one of the first, but it's relatively near the beginning. We see the students all in basically a. a I'm not sure if it's like an auditorium. I think it's an auditorium. Um, yeah, yeah. Basically, or, all or a gymnasium with a stage. Yeah. yeah something. So, yeah. Something like that. And they're and they're and they're and they're all arguing about um the you know, the main the main you know the main conflict of the movie the main besides the romance which is um um the whether or not they should you know fight against the um the um, tearing down of the building um and in the in the, in that the, in, in in that that argument we have like you know I mean you have like people pushing each other we have people yelling we have people jumping on stage like this is this this is a very accurate description of how um student um. Um, activism and student like um like um, um like these kinds of spaces would would be negotiated. They were they they happened in these these kind of absurdly um boisterous ways. Um, where you know everyone would like stand up and yell people down, and like everyone have their own ideas, and they'd be like these kind of places. And and in in, 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 in and, I, and I remember in that 
in, in that in that argument there, there's 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 a couple a few things. One, one of the things that, that that stands out is is that one group Nate yells anarchist at the you know our main group of people who want to preserve um, the the place. That's obviously you know this person is, is the, 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 the first of the movie is very clearly placing our students in this kind of space of the of of of, of the senso sekinin. Um, um, you know, of, of the trying to remember things. You're trying to, you know, these kinds of people, you know, it's, it's specifically anti-conservative movement, right? Um, and the reason why it's specifically anti-conservative is because anti-conservative is because the what what the left thought saw the anarchists and the communists in in in, in Japan at the time thought was that their current ruling party was not a sufficient break from the war. Like we that we weren't actually any different than the war. We were the same as the war. So it's like this kind of like you know the shouting of anarchists. This person kind of like um, tags this kind of um, very very strongly associates these, these these student movements. You know, which I talked about earlier with the nineteen sixty anti treaty protests. Um, um, but but and one of the things another thing that was noted in in that in that that um that 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 scene is that they say um. um you're 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 a minority. You're a minority. Only twenty percent of students want this. Want what the place kept up. You need to let 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 let, let, let us like like bulldoze it. And then someone said, and it sails back. That's just, this is a tyranny of the majority. Which I just, um, 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 I love I love I love that line. I, I thought it was really really funny and like really really um, apt. Um, yeah, it, it, it's really like um like like part of the fun of the scene is like these high schoolers like treating. The idea of like whether the like culture building where like the weirdos hang out yeah. being torn down, like and and they take that to to like signify so such big lofty ideals yeah. when actually like it, it's just like people who think it's neat and people who don't. Yeah, though I I I I, I don't know if it's people who think it's neat or people who don't, right? Because what 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 is what does our place like? Represent that. I think. I think we need to talk about the place represents. Um, right. It's this. It's this. For, first of all, the, the the place itself basically feels like a like a Miyazaki castle. Like it feels like the tiger moth, or like um, or like um, 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 the bathhouse. Um, the, the bathhouse was the you know the best example. And then there there's there several such examples in you know Miyazaki's work of these 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 kinds of like these these like weird quirky places which are clearly like they're old and like kind of falling apart but at the same time as they're, they're held together by the the efforts and like love of the people in them and they always have these weird like winches and pulleys in places and just yeah yeah you know and every, everything seems about just to fall apart being falling apart but everyone keeps just together and like this kind of like like space of like like physically manifested past that yeah, we there's understand. also there's also the sense that it's la- it feels larger on the inside, like <laughs> yeah, when they're the walking, and, and 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 we 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 like see like from, from like it pans from up like to down, and it's just it just feels like like it just goes on for too many floors. You know? Yeah. Oh yeah. And speaking of that, I I I found I I think that that's actually a great example of um Goro's mediocre directing was in the, when they when they move into the in, into the um. Um, house and they like you know they the camera pans down and we well, it doesn't camera there's, there's like a, it's a, it's like a, like, they're like walking in and there's a they flip the screen and then they, sh- they should have a, like a shot downwards at like a, a centipede moving around then like oh look how dead and they should have like a like a panning shot up showing the whole thing it's just like it's the most like um um amateurs kind of way to present like a new setting and it's just like i was just watching that and i and i, and I laughed when i saw this you know it's just like because I feel it almost felt like because it was so genuine and it's trying to present this place as this magical like like place, which almost felt like the students and their like the, and, and their very um youthful but you know energetic and like you know you know and, and hopeful kind of ways of approaching the future. A little 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 meta, but um um I I, I really like the mediocre directing in that scene. But um, <laughs> I mean I, um, I I I yeah, it's it's like ramshackle. It's like you know cobbled together, but it holds somehow, and you know. Yeah. I also love the Latin Quarter. I think I think when I first watched this movie, I said the Latin Quarter is the protagonist of this movie, and it kind of still is, uh, in a way. But um, it's like chaotic, artistic. Everyone gives it their own unique flourish. Everyone develops their own space. Clubs yeah, coexist like, I, I, in like I, I, I the most of, absurd ways. Yeah, I remember I, I, I joked about that. Like it's like one over the top fight sequence away from being a scene from Kill la Kill. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it's like yeah, it, 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 decentralized as fuck, and like it's, it's a place. For, I, I said earlier, forward-thinking people, right? Like they ha- engage in like science and media and yeah. clubs. And, and also, also, also it's for non the, the, the thing that they engage in are not Japanese, right? Oh, yeah. Every single person who's mentioned is like you know people like Nietzsche, people like um, I'm blanking on anyone else who's mentioned. Um, 
But there are there are there are others that I'm blanking on. But there's a bunch of Westerns mentioned. That's a Descartes quote written on the uh, yeah. Uh, on yeah, the but, side but, of the, the philosopher it's, booth. It's, it's, which, by the way, nice to see a, a, a cameo from Yard in a Ghibli movie. Oh yeah, uh, that, that, <laughs> that, that, that big philosophy dude. It's like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if he grows yeah. a beard, he's uh, <laughs> yeah. He, there we, he's, we got him. We got him. And I mean, my 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 view of the Latin Quarter is as a sort of you know, first of all. The interesting juxtaposition that we also went into a little bit earlier is that, for one, it is an old place that the forward-thinking people are trying to preserve. But also, you know, it's sort of like a, 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 a womb that will birth a new generation of, you know, yeah. a new Japan in a way, well, in a very I mean, romanticized way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, like, like in the first place, it clearly shows, you know, that, that Western, as I was talking before, clearly, and, and, you know, the architecture of it seems pretty, pretty Western as well. It kind of clearly shows that kind of the Yokohama, like, you know, gateway to the West that we already have, right? So that, you know, that the omnipresent force that, you know, you never see. Um, um, it, it's, it's, it's clearly present in there, right? In that kind of, you know, that, that future, future of Japan as, you know, the, Olymp the Olympic Japan, the Japan that is a part of the real, the, 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 the world for the first time, you know, as, since, as than it has been since, you know, the war. Um, so like, that's clearly shown with, 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 the, um, with the building. Um, and, and that the, you know the, the past, all the histories they have in the building, right? We have like I think one really important note of history in the building was the was the the, the forecasts for the um for the for the grades, right? Oh yeah. We have these these kinds of these kinds of like old test scores, which are which t tests and uh, um, including they have a test used. forecast, including <laughs> the, 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 the old math exam of like Miss Hokuto, the the doctor who we yeah, see like, like leaving the boarding house in one scene. Yeah, they they see they like they like they've them for decades of of these of these scores which they use to make forecasts for what's going to be on the test, right? And these these kinds of like, like learning from the spaces, past to predict the future. Yeah, to understand. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that's and that's kind of the the whole place is, you know, it's it's the, the understanding this place is understanding Stenzo Sekinin. That's that's kind of my my idea, right? Definitely. Of like um, like like we can't tear this place down. It's so important because everything that both everything that's important in the past, but but also how we using but but really what's important is how using the past of there allows us to navigate our present and future, right? And like in tearing it down, we just ignore that all. We just give in to the fascists who, you know, yeah. control the government again. <laughs> also, if, if we're being really charitable, then like p part of the plot of the movie is that like uh, Umi sort of like get, gets on board with the uh, with the place, and it's like, you know what we need to do? We, we should we should get some girls in here and clean no, no, it no. up oh, because no, because no, I... the, the reason why like eighty percent of the whole school hates the place is because the girls are staying the fuck away from there because it's. It's full of rude <laughs> no, no. guys and clutter and Play crime. Pl Clayton, unironically, <laughs> so during the 1960 pro student protest, a really important part of it was it was they were they were very like they they, they had people of like of all classes, they had people of all you know genders there. They had you know it was very much like, like student movement and um and you know professors and um and um, working class people, just people from all these different parts of society came together in these big protests. That's what made them so significant. And I a hundred percent think that the scene of all the girls walking through with their brooms and their masks walking into the place made me. That was the first image I had was of the kind of the clash, the bringing together of all these people. You know, because I really think that the fight over the um, school ground is a very direct metaphor for the um, anti treaty protests. Okay. Wow. Uh, just, uh, a, 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 another thing I uh, got to think about is like the, the, uh, the, the group singing in, in the, in the film, like first when the, the principal is coming in during the rowdy debate and everyone's like, oh, we're going to sing this song. And like, then like the, like routing the stops before the principal arrives. And then later, once the, uh, once the chairman, uh, arrives to inspect the, uh, or, or re-inspect, I suppose the, uh, Latin quarter, they also like sing a song. I'm not sure what those songs are exactly, but they read to me like, you know, old, you know, I love my country type songs. Uh, does anyone know here? Because I, I, I certainly... I, I don't know, but I think, uh, uh, at least from my research, Goro seemed to have mostly written and rewritten lyrics for these songs himself. But I think what's really noteworthy is I like how they use these songs which sound so homey, conservative, you know my land, my people, you know. These songs, they use them strategically, right? When they argue and fight on the stage, they notice a teacher is coming and everyone stops fighting and starts singing. The teacher comes in, looks, please, leaves again. You know, it's their 
hiding kind of behind that sense of nationalism, right? Even later when the president, the the bureaucrat, they get to, you know, verify that the building is, you know, uh, good. Like they sing a song for him as well, you know? <laughs> so it, it's kind of like the, the idea is they're kind of like coating this in some opportunistic or strategic, you know, optics to like it, make their project it's a, it's work. It's a performance. Yeah. It doesn't come from like uh, within or something. Yeah, I, I feel like that must be it, right? Like all of these songs are used very strategically, right? Yeah, 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 and and, and just like with the rowdiness that like gets interrupted by the song, the uh, the the over like the politeness and uh, deference and like the singing gives way to just like absolute chaotic uh, cheering when when the chairman's like, "You convinced me, you you little rascals." Uh, it's a good thing that I am one of the good guys. <laughs> oh no! Oh, it, it's, it's, it, I I just kind of like envision the conversation being something like this. So, what do you want this house for? For nationalism, Mister? For nationalism? Yes, for nationalism. Okay then, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> actually, building, uh, act, actually developing the next generation of progressives yes. like a boss. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly that. Ah. Uh, yeah, okay, I, I, I really like this reading. But yeah, what they do is really uh, uh, performative, right? Like their strategies. Let's start by the very first thing we see the student activists doing, right? Shun climbing on the rooftop, jumping down so they get a photo opportunity and just use those photos as like propaganda. I took note of like how important photos, photographs are for this movie. You know, photographs of the past, of like the, the old sailors, photographs of Shun jumping from the roof, Shun holding Umi's hand, like or Umi rather pulling her out of the, out of the pond, uh, uh, stuff like that. These photos are heavily used in their campaign, in their, in their strategy to kind of make propaganda for their, for their you know, preserving the old building. And, you know, also as a connection to the past. And, of course, these photos are staged for a pure performative reason. And that's kind of all you need to know immediately right there, right? Like about how they try to manipulate the narrative. Well, I, uh, I think we've gone down a side road because I think uh, the, th uh, the Thunderer, you were about to like tie this Latin quarter stuff back to the uh uh the thing with the 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 absent fathers i think oh yeah yes 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 okay so um um let's see where was i oh yeah so 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 we move back to you know back to the absent father like what is the father what is the lack of a father you know representing it's you know the lack of you know it's, 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 it's that past, it's that, you know, that, that, that lack of a past, that kind of, you know, not having a handle over, you know, these, these histories, these kind of, we have no, we have no real understanding of the past. We just, you know, aestheticize it. We have just we worshipped it. We don't have this ideas of it, you know, we, and in, in doing so we have, we let, you know, in, you know, in Japanese history specifically, we, they let, you know, Japanese, you know, basically military leaders become prime minister and the like, right. Like the whole, the, the country, the country went through an extreme, you know, red scare, you know, it, it purged like, like hundreds of thousands of people, um, and and so on, right? Like we 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 kind of like we kind of like as in Japanese history, like you go you go through and like you know take take the war widows, right? The war widows are taken. They they're they're they they're told no, you have to be a wife. You can't be you know you can't you can't like present yourself as a war widow while not in in in, in you know living in the role of the, the of, of the wife. You can't you know be an independent person who's you know has a sexuality or has a um has an interest in working those kinds of things. You just have to, you know, live and suffer and, you know, pray and that kind of thing, right? We have all these, these kinds of ideas of like, of in, in Japanese history of these, these, these lack of memory leading to kind of repression, leading to people not having access to their emotions, to their sexualities, to their, um, to their, you know, their material, you know, material, can, like improving their ability to improve their material conditions. Right. And we see this, you know, in, in this in this in in the in this um this world right we 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 not we 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 go to like the 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 the, the school building the Latin Quarter and we have to it's it, it is a beautiful thing with all these wonderful things but you just people walk in and they just see all the dirt they see nothing they don't they see a thing that we have to tear out to then get access to the future you know the future is where because you know in Japanese the history of the time we were um tearing everything down so we could rebuild it all and show it up for get ready for the Olympics there's a great quote um. Um, I have from um, Ito Jun, who's a um, he's a, um, a literary critic from the time, who said, unless the majority of people tacitly recognize this as a kind of war, 
this being the Olympics, the Japanese could never bear this thorough destruction of their living conditions. However, in actuality, people calmly endured it. Almost everybody must, almost everybody must have instinctively known that this war was worth the sacrifice. And this was kind of, he was doing this as kind of a mockery, but we, we, have, we conceive of this Olympics, of this future, as a second war, as being, again, a repeat maybe of World War II. Um, but we've repressed our understanding of our relationship between the, the, the present and the past into the ways where we do not have access to the war anymore. Like, 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 um, 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 what's the main girl's name? Um, Umi. 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 Like Umi and her father. She doesn't have access to him. She just has this idea of him, which she's then repeating in the pot of her day. It's, it's a, it's repetition. It's not memory. Or we have, or we have the, the, um, the, 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 um, the, the, the school place, right? These people, these people in the school place, the reason why before it's not, when it's not cleaned up, it is kind of serving that same, that same element, right? They're just repeating in that, that place. They don't, they don't have any interest in making the place into a beautiful place to live in that, that can, you know, that's like, you know, architecturally sound or anything, right? They're just kind of repeating the past. And, and so, and, and some repetitions are deemed, you know, appropriate, like the repetitions of a, of a war widow, and some are deemed inappropriate, like those of, you know, bum students living in a stupid um um castle um <laughs> aladdin quarter um but but yeah in 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 tie, in, 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 in going through that, that process of tearing it down right of just of, of, of just taking away the past we don't have access anymore which but which, which is you know it, which is even worse than perhaps perhaps even worse than just re re the repetition of the mindless repetition that other people go through like umi does because now i have no access to it so i have no understanding of the trauma that i went through of the of the things that happened in the past right i don't have our we just don't we don't have our um our um our um our old test course so we can't pass the modern test <laughs> in a very yeah. it's just an on the nose metaphor it's like the more i think about it um um it's pretty on the nose this, uh, but that's what makes it beautiful yeah. because i feel like yeah. if you're taking your viewers onto this ride into an anachronistic yokohama in the 60s and you're trying to make this point. I, you, you f I feel like you kind of have to be on the nose unless you explicitly like feature students fighting the treaties, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, true. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, so I, I want. I think we should go into that's the next point. We need kind of need to talk about um, um, uh, Mr. Buddha. Yeah, so Mr. Buddha, I guess um, because he kind of looks like Buddha because he has like the 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 earlobes, the the long one. I guess his face in general, whatever. Um, <laughs> that's a bureaucrat chairman of some official government instituted modernization project and those were the people that were actually the ones you know basically taking care of getting rid of the old uh, uh quarter latin quarter and replacing it with a new building so the plan of umi shun and the glasses wearing compatriot whose name uh, escapes me uh is to go and talk to him. It was Umi's idea, talk to the chairman, see what can be done, and they're going. He's, to be clear, he's a, he's just chairman of the high school. I think he's in Tokyo. I think he's like some urban development. Yes, yes, thing, yeah, he's the chairman the high of, the high, of the high school and he's a businessman. Okay. Uh, I, 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 okay, you know, I suppose. For me, it was kind of vague what his function really is. He was like the chairman, yeah. like some kind of chairman. <laughs> and I just saw him as like responsible for some like aspect of the like urban development program. Like yeah. some like I mean, vague I, sense of a bureaucrat who's involved yeah. in the modernization project. That's that's how I kind of took him. I mean, first I took him as a capitalist, but that was wrong because he's a government official. Oh, he's so. both. He's both actually. I guess I guess in a way. Yes, I, right? I, I, I just checked. And yeah. Both. Okay. <laughs> okay sure. he, he is both. Okay, so he is a government official involved in like urban development, but also from a a, a private industry, a private development kind of angle. Whatever. He is a interesting dude because. Our students go to him and try to convince him to not have the Latin Quarter removed. And they do so by bringing a girl. And he notices, oh, I see you have a real girl with you. Let me talk to the girl. And it's oh, like... A, a real female? Yeah. And it's like a really paternalistic like kind of conversation when they're like in the office. And he just immediately ignores the boys and goes to her. And like, hey, where you come from? What, what does your dad do? Oh, your dad died in the war? I guess I'll come check out your Latin Quarter. Um... Can't really make much sense of him. I, I gotta be honest. Like the whole idea that kind of like the way I view it is sort of that they found this official. They kind of like tried to you know uh, get him to 
like their project of renovating the Latin Quarter, look at it, it's good, okay, here you go. Which is also why they sing the song, why they like try to convince him with like the things he might like. But like as a character, uh, he's like a really uh, uncomfortable kind of presence. I feel. Yeah, I I, I think I, I I really don't like how the movie structurally finishes, and he is a large part of what I'd, frustrates me about it because it it feels like we spend the whole movie setting up this really fascinating like um um you know kind of like very anti anti governmental um you know movement about trying to explore and remember the past and kind of navigate the world and save our you know building from like the like unthinking like like breaking down of you know the old and like you know the, you know and just all, all these things right and we resolve all that by um asking the big um um, the, the big, the big, the big guy who sexually harasses one of the student female students when he comes to the building <laughs> to come and you know save us all. And it's like, why? I don't, I don't understand this function. It seems to just blow. It just seems to go in the face of everything I've understood about the movie up to this point. Yeah, but when you say se- just, sex, when you say sexually harassed, you're, you're talking about the time that like he he like grabs her shoulder like really firmly for some fucking reason. Yeah, yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It, it's it's all kinds of weird. So. Like, the way in which I understand, of course, is he is the bureaucratic guy they need to overcome, right? Yeah, yeah. And From they do so, yeah. I think, my reading is, by constructing a faux sense of nationalism, right? Like, because when he comes to the Latin Quarter, they sing the song, they all stand in line, they all, like, applaud, and it's, like, all formal. And it's not like they genuinely care about that guy right like it's not like some real admiration like oh look at this benevolent chairman coming into our house and taking care of our issues it's definitely a, a opportunism a political opportunism and i find yeah. that seems to be what is expressed here the only but- thing that i find really important to problematize i guess in our critical analysis of the film is that i would have liked a sort of clarification because if the student uprising to protect the Latin Quarter is the metaphor for the student uprising to prevent the treaties. Um, I would have felt like we could have had an inclusion, something like it is only possible for this student revolution to work as benignly as it does because it's like a little thing of like protecting one house. Whereas the real deal, the thing we're constructing a metaphor for is certainly not as easily won as simply, you know, uh, yeah. uh, appealing to one of the guys the, who has the power to do so. Yeah, the, the, the whole, the whole, to have like a heart of gold and a good sense of humor. Yeah, the, 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 whole, the, whole, the whole scene was in- interesting to me because so it, it really reminded me, so af- after Kishi Nobu, um, Nobusuke, the, you know, the fascist prime minister, was, you know, was deposed after he successfully got his, you know, got his treaty got through, but he, was, he, was, he had to resign afterwards. Um, I think the, the word you're looking for but, is cancelled. That is not the word I was looking for. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, 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 his replacement, um, Ikeda Hayato, um, he wasn't, you know, it wasn't, it took about a month before they decided that this guy was going to be it. But he immediately said after seeing this, these, these, these big protests, he was like, he said, if this energy can be turned towards Japan's economic development, Japan can surely become an economic superpower. And I got the <laughs> same kind of vibes from Jesus from the chairman Christ. as I got from like the fucking, you know, the, the new conservative ruler of Japan that came that was deposed by the original movement. That's and, the, and that whole thing that's a really bad taste in my mouth because I, I, I just I just don't know what it's trying to accomplish. Right? I mean, it just in, in so that confused. regard, <laughs> even better. Right? Like it is someone who, if you can, you opportunistically manipulate, right? Like, if you're an activist, right, you try to take wins where you can. And if your win that you can take is we get to keep our Latin quarter by simply pretending to, like, you know, channel our energies for nationalism, which they kind of do. I think I disagree with this reading. Uh, Like, the whole characterization of him... Uh, it's, it's it's just like too positive for that because yeah. like they, yeah they have to wait a bit uh, and they say he's busy turns out yeah he is busy but he like deliberately gets time for them and like like uh, ask uh, like some other people to like oh uh, I'll, I'll be there in like five minutes just g- give me some time with these kids he just Im- immediately like uh, immediately sympathetic to them is no like, he's oh, not immediately sympathetic he is sympathetic no, no, like, because he, he, he hears the girl talk about her uh, deceased father 
Okay, sure, but 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 even so, like it it takes him like no time at all to be like, okay, like cancel my appointments for tomorrow. I've got to go there. He I goes think that's there important, and, and though, he, right? he like vibes with them. <laughs> like he goes around like asking them for like like ask the uh, the astronomy club. Like, what have you figured out yet? And they're like, the universe is a big place and nothing else. And he's like, I like your jib. I like the cut of your jib. And and he goes to the philosophy guy and is like oh that's a Diogenes reference ho, ho, ho. like he's vibes with them like he, he's yeah. clearly a, the cool professor you know yeah, it, it, he it, definitely is, not, is, not, is, is being really manipulated as, though right like he it's is not, it's not really yeah. presented that way though like, I don't yeah, think there's the, no song, the song is definitely manipulation. manipulation. Like, I, we can hopefully agree the song definitely is codified in this movie as manipulation. I would, I would need, I would need to see here that see the lyrics to know that for certain because it felt yeah, exactly. more spontaneous. And, and it, 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 it felt kind of like a spontaneous like welling of like excitement or something. But you have yeah, to exactly. remember like, it's not the first, that way. the first song they sang was not because they wanted to sing a song, but to deceive the teachers. Sure, I understand that. If, if there were like several songs used in that way, but it's only the two songs, so I don't see a strong correlation. I mean, there are only yeah. these two songs and, and you, in the movie, right? These, you could just as easily read it as like a transition from like, oh, we're, we're singing to deceive this person to, oh, we're singing because we're proud of the work we did. That That's like, and because we're unified now. Uh, yes. Like, that's, that's issue. Yeah. I, I just don't. I just, it, it, it is so unclear and weird that I don't. I don't. I don't know how to read it. I, don't I mean, know. it's definitely oh, unclear and weird, but I, <laughs> but I can propose a modification of the reading at least a little bit. Um, so let's say it's not an opportunistic uh, manipulation of the one bureaucrat they got to, you know, basically get their hands on to manipulate. Right? Let's say it's indeed something else. Let's say, um, let's look closely at how did they get to get him to come over and develop sympathy. Well, through her to Umi's uh, deceased father. So this is yeah. why I felt like there is an appeal to nationalism, there's an appeal to shared history, because in that moment is where his shell kind of cracks. So now no, we no, are I... kind of... No, that is definitely the case. So now the question is just, does it split because he's a nationalist and that's why he feels that way? Or does it split because he's depicted as one of the good ones? No, I, I, I disagree with the take mainly because like even if like in the text of the film it you could easily read it into that. I, I don't see it in the framing whatsoever. Wait, no, like, hold uh, on. In the scene where they sit in the office and she says my father died in Korea and he's like, Oh, well I'll make time for you now. That's not like explicitly the one to one relationship that because of her presence, because of her disclosing this past that the to the relationship to the past, that he then decides to give him a shot. Like um, no, no it, it feels like he's already open to the idea. He seems bemused at the fact that, like, these students, oh, they came here and they decided to, like, like wait patiently and I'm going to give them the time of day. And, 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 like, it's not even, like, he he, he already seems to be, like, oh, like, kind of on the side and he just seems, like, interested in them. And she asks her, I don't know why she, the, why she asks her specifically. See, but that's um, something we need to answer. And I feel like it's not just flavor text we throw in there for nothing. Because as the viewer, we know this part of the story. Like she's not telling us anything new. Yeah, but at the same time, it doesn't carry over uh, in, in, into the like f following scene where like where he arrives and, ha and vi you know, vibes with the weirdo students just for fun. Like, and it just could, seems could, like a generally good guy. Could I? Could and, I? Could I? Pre could I present? Yeah, yeah. A I, I, I have. I have a possible reading. Um, I, this is. I. I. I, th I think this is actually what Goro was going through. Um, just like thinking about. It. So we are presented with the old guy with the death of her father in Korea, right? Now we. That's okay. So we thematically under, we understand what that thematically represents in the film, right? We, that's that is the kind of the you know lack of access to you know one's history and one's you know kind of ritualistic like you know like 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 obsessive you know playing out of one's role in relation to that that figure of that space that lack and then we was we, if we compare that thing you know something that inspired him to his kind of vibing with the weirdo kids if say the we we can see both those things because the weirdo kids are presented in the inside the Latin Quarter which Latin Quarter is coded as a memory of the past, right? So both these things are memories of the past that we coded as memories of the past, both her father and, you know, the, 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 the Latin Quarter, right? So he comes into that space and he kind of sees, okay, so I see, I, I, he, I maybe he comes to realize in this regard on a, like a, a meta, you know, a, like a, you know, a, this is a movie. And so he, th we're thinking of movie logic right now, um, that there's kind of a, um, a, 
you, you, there's you see these people like speak th speaking in this way and like you know, being weird and like stuff and he's just like he's like oh look at all this look at this 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 spear look at these people look at the people like you know taking all this energy from this space all this like finding the past there right it's just like the same way this girl's you know his father's death is meaningful to her right he's like maybe he's like maybe those things connecting is what makes him say oh i want to keep the place i want i want to not hurt the place because he understands the place now as a place of the past a shrine in a way um but that's just that's kind of that's, that's the only real theory i can come up with i mean yeah, that's, yeah that's, i think that's part of the reason part of the reason i don't see the deception is that it just feels genuine it feels like they are genuinely like uh polite they genuinely respect this guy they uh they, 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 they're, they're just earnestly asking him for help he hears that and he's like you know what i hear your, your prayers have been answered i'm gonna go there and they oh, like but do, do, do you remember that answer his questions and they earnestly sing like that that's that's the like that's how yeah. it's framed. Like I, I don't see that's, the deception it, it, it as feels part a little of bit like alternate history, right? Like they, they, yeah, it, they yeah. are going to the government yeah. proposing, let's find a new way of reinterpreting the history instead of just you know cementing uh, the sewer ducts closed. Uh, we are now renovating some yeah. element of the past. We are keeping it around to remember. And the government yeah. official goes, "Oh, that's cool. I like that." And it's like now we, yeah. it's like still appealing to the idea of modernization, but by different means. And why I say it feels like alternate history is, of course, that's not the kind of modernization that was done. That is the modernization that was done way later when you know academics went on to like actually process like uh, the kind of repression of war memory that happened during that time. And that's, um, I suppose, you know, this might be the key word. This feels anachronistic, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. it, it it also just feels like not uh like it's just also not a very interesting way of resolving it because like start of the movie the characters want to preserve the Latin quarters. End of the movie they put in effort and they succeeded. Huzzah. Like like it's very like straightforward in that way. Uh like 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 y you imagine like a more interesting ending would involve them like just being straight up rejected. And being like having to figure out a new way, or like making just making a Latin quarter yeah. out of the new stuff, or just like or doing just... an actual like doing an actual like sit-in protest. Yeah, against yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah. We're doing that's that's so now. We're doing squatting now. That's what I, that's yeah. what that's what I was expecting. Is the thing, right? Yeah. I was that's like when they went to sit into into the guy's house. I was expecting them to like sit there for the next ten hours and not get an appointment. And then he walked past them at the end of the day, saying, "What's up." then go out that was that's what i was expecting <laughs> i mean because that I, I seems guess, <laughs> alternate history is a, is a recurring motif in like the the miyazaki server right um i kind of wondering if we can get something out of the fact that it is deliberately anachronistic it feels like it's yeah. deliberately anachronistic because you cannot have this you know mediation of the current times conflict with modernization and then just go to the government official, propose it, and it's okay, right? Like there is something just, see, see, that, that, we're supposed that's to why, dry, get from that. that. That's why my like instinct was to, to like see these students as, as this like as a conservative thing, because like if the me if the message is like be by being uh, polite and earnest, putting in the work, respecting the past. The system will listen and correct itself. That's that feels like yeah. the message, that's, and that doesn't that, feel like yeah. a very like you know <laughs> progressive. That's, 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 that yeah, feels that's, like that's, a conservative. That's, that's, that's what I felt too, and it just, it just so in contrast to you know if you know anything about sixties Japanese history and what actually happened, it just seems to the point where it's like that's like it seems dishonest or ignorant, and that's what bothers me about it. Yeah. Um, I, I I think like what this... did Miyazaki think? Because sen Miyazaki Senior wrote this, right? Like, yeah. what? How how do we put this together? I think. Well, I mean, g give uh, honestly, like like uh, uh, an old adage goes that like you, you give five directors the same script uh, script and you get five very different movies. Um, I, I I think like it's it's partly on the script level. I. I I honestly think like the script is like one of the weaker parts of the movie. I think it feels like a like maybe a second draft. 
Um, I, I don't, I, in the first half, it's really, I think the script is really strong. It's just in the second half where it gets a little Yeah, weird. exactly. That's why I, yeah. I, I say because like the, like the ending is, is especially lackluster, which is like a, a sign that like we, someone had like a we, 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 good, we do, we good do still, idea and, and couldn't like get, we, get to a satisfying we do still ending. Need to, we do, do still need to talk about the other part of the ending. Which is oh, also yeah. a mess. Uh, should, <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> no, um, but, but I just wanted to mention that like, Part like my biggest problem with this movie is just how disconnected the two elements of the movie are: the Latin Quarter plot and the yeah. uh, the Wincest or not Wincest plot. Didn't I, didn't I spend the last like hour explaining why they were the they they they, they, they weren't disconnected? Yeah, that's well, what we did. did. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> true, absolutely true. They are. Yes, they have like they have connected themes. Absolutely correct. They do not connect emotionally to each other. They do not connect character-wise to each other. What does that There's mean? There's something missing there. Because <laughs> like, like it, no, they, no, have, they have the same characters about, and they feel the same. I don't know. Yeah, yeah and like, like think about it. Like the scene um, where they, they, they're everyone's celebrating because like, hooray, we won. The that part of the plot is resolved. The Latin Quarter remains, and then it's like Shun arrives and hey, U Umi. Come here. We need to get to the other plot that's happening, like wait. way out there, and has nothing to do but with. But wait, it. hold Let's on. Go. That has to do with first of all, we fought for the ability to deal with our past. We get to keep the Latin Quarter, which is a symbol now we do, now for we dealing don't with, deal the with the past. Okay, okay, now so, yeah, we the deal with the, the past, right? The, the past yeah. is coming to get us right okay, now. Okay, yeah. okay. We're, we're getting back to, to to this thing that like you can make a movie that has like interesting themes that explore them in interesting ways that still doesn't really hold together together dramatically. And that's still a problem with the movie. So they're, yes, they are thematically connected. Oh, it holds together dramatically perfectly. I mean, the beats all happen in the same rhythm, right? Like, I feel like this <laughs> is like oh, the... the beats happen next to each other. Ergo, they're connected. No, they, they are disconnected because they... I mean, like, I'm not, so, okay, okay, I'm not I mean, vibing kind of with the approach, I guess. Like, I, I just simply disagree yeah. in, like, the, the, like okay, categorically enough, with but, the approach, but, but, I suppose. I mean, I, yeah, I, mean but, but, I, I can agree I that I, like I, I was kind of... Part, like, of the movie, part of the movie that's missing, I feel, is... How? What does the Latin Quarter, like emotionally, character-wise, mean for to Umi that connects to her father? What is it she sees in the Latin Quarter that like connects to that struggle she has? And I just don't see what it is that, that there's a missing scene somewhere, or like some some. My draft notes would be like, where is the scene? Where Umi gets convinced, where she gets like uh, bought into the spirit of the place. When she, she, she just first like, goes in there, and there, starts helping she out. She just keeps going there because she she has a crush on Shun. Yeah, and Shun but, is associated with her father. You know, she doesn't yeah, know this yeah, yeah. at the time, yeah. but like no, we no, know. No, 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 to the fight for the Latin no, Quarter. No, it happens during the fight for the Latin Quarter. Yeah, Umi it is literally, during, but like, it Umi is literally drawn into the fight for the Latin Quarter because he jumps from the roof and pulls her into a photograph they take as like a propaganda and, 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 piece. Yes, but my oh, point oh, is, it could also, have been also, anything. Also, no, also noted, yeah, it could have been anything, but notice that, you know, when when um, Shunda stops talking to her for a few days because he realizes that she's, they're, they're siblings, um, is... um. Um, she didn't stop going and working on the, the project. She doesn't stop yeah. stop being the head of the, the the women's group there. Like it's like so. It's, it's clear that you know her connection is still there, right? It's not just Shun. It's just Shun yeah, is just but, our gateway, but, right? Yeah, but but we don't. I, I don't. I don't feel like that we probably established like like how like in her her character what it is that won her. We don't really understand what it is about Shun that uh, and his relationship to the Latin Quarter. We don't have a scene where like he explains why he got won over, why this place is important to him. I, I mean, we, I, I, we, I, I, we, we really understand that. as viewers what Shun comes to represent within the students' movement. I don't think we need him to sit down and say, well, yeah, my big brother was really into the students' movement as well, and he told me about how great the community there is, and this is why I joined. I don't think we need that theme, scene that's yeah. completely like it's, superfluous. I think we need it's, something. It's, it's, I think uh, we mean, uh, we I need know, more I, I, than just this is well, a thing that is happening while this romance is happening. What we need is just a, they you know, think. just I think what we need instead of that, I don't, I don't think anything was missing necessarily it's just the whole last part of the movie needed to be cut and replaced <laughs> yeah yeah no 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 but, 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 but uh, I, I, I think the reason why the ending doesn't work is because that disconnect becomes so clear I think specifically there's one scene and it's when they go and talk to the chairman and she 
like, and he randomly, out of nowhere, like, asks, what did your dad do? Like, hey, could you please, like, oh, explain I, I mean, your character to there's me? There's a feminist like, reading here, which is very easy. That's because uh, uh, men think about women in relationship to the men that surround yeah, these sure. women. Yeah, that's, that's, that's Sure, that's, but, but, like, yeah. in, in terms of plotting, like, like the, the whole, again, the Latin Quarter thing is plot-wise almost completely disconnected from the plot of figuring out this romance thing and and figuring out her own like daddy issues I mean, thing it's disconnected thing, from the latin quarter plot wise not thematically yes i know the thing anyway, we have to just i was about to say yeah. something so he um so 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 he like uh, feels like honestly it felt like it was out of nowhere okay and that's a bad sign um just just ask like hey wh who was your dad and she was like oh uh, he died on the ship and that's when we get the flashback of like the bomb happening. And I think like, uh, like in terms of framing, it's supposed to look like this is the moment where like she comes to term with, with the death of her father or something. Um, but it just feels co like a complete non sequitur to the scene. It doesn't really, it doesn't really fit with the conflict she is in at that moment of like trying to convince a bureaucrat to come and inspect the Latin Quarter that she'd been working on, it doesn't connect. I mean, thematically, and it, it does. feels to, it, it, it just feels like an. <laughs> I, 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 I think I explain it another way that that I think you'll appreciate more. I think it's that there is no real end goal. There's no real workable solution for either of the issues, right? For either her her ennui about the past or about or about you know the you know the, the construction of this building, right? Instead, we get these kind of sweeping, ignorant like romanticizations that kind of paint over the issues. Um, and those kinds of paintovers, I think, speak if you if speak to a lack of like you know a core kind of direction that the movie was going right. Instead, it just because I think I think that's what Platon is like noticing here is is a thematic thing. It's that there was no kind of thing to kind of take all these ideas and say here is where we need to go. Here is the future. Here is the way we can process thing. We have some kind of little things like oh now we raise our flag to Shun, but that feels cheap and unearned. Um, yeah, yeah, and and, and so, like I said before, the the chairman arrives, Deus Ex Machina style. Turns out he's a cool guy and wants to uh, to keep it around, and then like disconnected from that. Oh, that's the other plot. Let's go, and they go to the yes. other plot and resolve that. Also, kind of just by we should just by talking talk to people. Why, like, why the incest? There's no, there's no breaking sense room in the of film. like where what the journey was and when they arrived there. Like there's so, there's just like stuff happening, and we're told, and and we we see that like again that flashback to the ship being hit by the bomb. We're told that this is like a significant moment for her, but it it just doesn't track emotionally. It just so doesn't fit. For me, it tracked emotionally perfectly, and I can tie this into an anecdote about my own life that I've had recently been going through. I suppose not not going through. It sounds too big, uh, but it has to do with like things I've been going through. So. I felt like the emotional arc of the movie, the core of it is that we are meant to understand a transformation that Umi undergoes from mourning and being stuck in the past to, to a person able to work through the past and understand, you know, what happened in the past, what shaped her, what gave her, you know, her way into this life. And also a, a sort of degree of thankfulness for, you know, the people that died in the war that kind of that left the families behind that kind of tried to stay alive you know the memory of like the 40s the mother that still you know raised her and like got an education anyways off that and the way it connects in into my life is you know i'm german right like germany has a long literary tradition of post-war literature for example the so-called trümmer literature or like the rubble literature of like the literally people that return from the war and look at the rubble uh, that the country is in now, like dealing with the, that past, right? But even a more immediate short-term event, let's say, because I'm an East German and we had a country collapse into absolute severe economic crisis and dismay, you know, and my parents lived through that. And this year, I don't know why, but I had like a huge uh, moment of understanding the sort of economic struggles and the uh, 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 li literal struggles my parents lived through as these times happened to them and around them, right? That in in it is normal for me to grow up in East Germany and see that in every town and every city there is 30% of all economic and commercial buildings are ruins, empty, broken windows, everything. That's normal for me. 
because I grew up in a country that was economically fucking ruined after, you know, the reunification of Germany. So what I've come to really emotionally and sentimentally understand as well is the degree to which the past has affected people here that live today. You know, parents that have become disillusioned with the concept of government because they've seen one government collapse and another one drop them completely. The concept of like success of building a stable, you know, household and family relationship going from socialism into very ruthless capitalism. All of these ideas, like how history has hurt these people and how people still kept persevering. Like the whole notion that is so called to many Miyazaki movies of how do you live is also central to this movie. And what I see in Umi is someone going from unaware and sort of like naively mourning to someone who becomes deeply aware of the social ramifications and the social uh, structuring of trauma that has been inflicted on a country. So, for example, the trauma of the bomb, the trauma of the war, of orphan children, of dead soldiers, and so on, and of parents that grew up in these times and still managed to raise their children, right? And that is what I think the emotional arc of the movie is. Her learning to, through the symbol of this uh, uh, wonderful Latin quarter, which is like the symbol of dealing with your past, renovating it, you know, really working through the past instead of ignoring and repressing it, really dealing with the traumatic war memory, really dealing with the economic anxieties of 19, uh, uh, 1990s Germany, for example, in my case, um, mm -hmm. that allows a different view in the future towards the future, towards the world, and towards mourning as well in, in Umi's case. So for me, the emotional are connected because because I gradually through the movie was led to understand all these characters as grounded and surrounded and immersed in their history rather than distinct actors outside of history as they might be thinking of themselves uh, in, in naive ways, right? All of them exist in like continued historic struggles that created them and that will create future generations coming off from them. And that is exactly uh, what I see the emotional arc of the film being, like this deep realization that history has happened, you know? And, and that's, I think, a profound emotion that this movie gave me, which I cannot really uh, understate in, in how tremendously important I found it. Uh, well, I do not disagree with any of that. Like, those themes are there. That arc is definitely there. And I don't think this is, like, a bad movie. It has great moments. And especially, like, the the moments of, like, reckoning a bit with the, with the past are, 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 like, some of the highlights. But that doesn't really address my criticism. My criticism is, like, it's not dramatized prob uh, properly. It's not... Uh, probably the, the uh, that that theme goes really really well with the uh, with the dead dad and the are we siblings plot, um, but that uh, and and it sort of thematically ties into the Latin Quarter uh, plot, but there's no like moment of like where where they click together. They they never click together for in me a, uh, in a dramatic way. The Latin Quarter. And that's a problem with the movie. Even if even if those themes are important, and even if you think that that makes the movie uh, really good. Like, that's still a problem with the movie. So for me, the Latin Quarter is the mechanical interaction with the past, right? In the Latin Quarter, what do you do? You work, you clean it up, you paint, you repair. What you'd also do is you find old stacks of memories. You find old, you know, articles. You find old exams. You find the history of people you know. And we see Umi in the, in the film engaging in all these mechanical actions of interacting with the past. And this is how the project of restoring the Latin Quarter becomes her project of, of becoming grounded in history, of becoming someone who can engage with history. And that okay, okay. is uh indeed like a complete connection and like you're gonna say basically the same thing again right like about the dramatization yeah, of the we're, connecting we're of the plot. talking in circles around but each other because I'm just, again did, let me just say themes. like the broad thing right I yeah. don't and I care it. about like anything necessarily like literally like walk me through it from A to B what is like the moment where the character uh, has this realization because I don't need the character to have the realization we, I'm not watching this for her internality I'm watching this movie for what this movie can tell me what it can give me and it gives me all of those things like I don't need to pretend like fictional characters have internality to be satisfied with what a movie can give me right like I'm not well, trying but, to say it dismissively, but the but reason like, I'm pointing these things out is not to like say that 
oh, act, actually, these themes are th- this all, all this stuff doesn't exist. I'm saying there's so many missed opportunities in the movie. It could have been so much like much more like emotionally resonant if if it had like if if it had taken some a few different choices. Like like let, let me try to illustrate it with like a, an an example. Um, let's say that what if there was a moment in the movie where Umi had to decide between like uh like straight up like make a decision between the latin quarter and the home like like she could like like a moment where like she's really sad that she can't raise the flag that morning because she had to do something important for that but she realized at that point dramatically she re like she realizes like this is actually something that is more important to me than raising those flags because those like those aren't necessary but this is like something working to uh, towards that would be like just a simple connection that would add something like thematically to the movie as well but that that choice doesn't arrive like there's there's some thematic stuff that like oh she gets home later and stuff but that that's just as much you know oh she's hanging out with a boy so she has some other things going on um, you know, I, I think, I think is, you um, kind of dug yourself in a hole right there, right? You say, I wish there was the scene where a trade-off between the home life and the Latin quarters depicted. Then you say, oh, but there are scenes which depict this trade-off, but they don't count. Uh, why do they not the, count? The, the, the problem with those scenes there is that those scenes happen, but they never like completely go into it, right? She, they, they yeah, make it, not, so it, make, it makes it difficult for her to, to do it to, like, to make her dinner, but she still makes the dinner. Um, yeah, she still makes it, and it's not like presented as a deliberate choice. She makes a realization she has. That, that that's not drama. Uh, that's that's a, a way you could have connected the two plot lines and made it thematically relevant. Like another, th- uh, like another example would be like, what if like one of her parents went to the sc- the school? Maybe her mom went to the school, or maybe j- just like one of the older kids like got to go to the Latin Quarter after they cleaned it up, and they could be like, wow, this place like. Is it like like I I remember like what this place used to mean, and I wonder what it will mean to you. Like then you could like connect the family to that, or she could find an like instead of just like oh this um uh, like like this this girl at the boarding house she got perfect test scores. Wow, maybe she like just finds a picture of her mom and asks her about it or something. Like th- th- there's. Like those are just like examples of how you can like tie those two plots together in a meaningful way, and they don't. So, so here's one thing I'll definitely agree to, right? I definitely agree that the uh, Buddha guy and his, this entire res- resolution of the Latin Quarter plot, uh, as like getting him there and touring around the thing, is deeply unsatisfying and underwhelming, right? And yes. the structural issue that the kind of ending that we get like where they get uh, taken to run after the ship and you know catch up and talk to that person is kind of glued onto that that i think is an issue that is downstream from the issue we already had so because i honestly feel a lot more fondly about the other ending scene right like that that scene where they go talk to that i feel even more negatively about that scene. okay then we we can we can talk about that that (laughs) then we can talk Um, about that um yeah yeah. let's talk about it actually yeah let's talk about it so they um she she gets told like like the night before when when, when she gets home and meets her meets her mom like oh you're, you're back and she asks her about it. She explains the situation, and that's like and and uh, and Umi like like uh, starts starts sobbing because like, uh, and I think like that's probably like the right moment to say like this is the moment where she like really reckons with like the tragedy of the whole thing. Um, but like so that's at that point it's actually resolved. Like we know now that that like his. Like Shun's dad and her dad are not the same dad. It's not no, she, Winces. She, 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 it's not Twinces. She, she doesn't. She doesn't it's necessarily not, trust it, that, though. To be clear, like she was, she was definitely like a little like, you sure? Like she, she's, yeah. not, she's not. 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 There's not a full acceptance yet. So we still need this. I, 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 I suppose, but like for the audience, like that moment is like pretty okay. We I finally said, got the explanation. I, for the people I, I, who are I, 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 into I the incest it. kink. I didn't believe it because <laughs> I wanted the incest. What? I was I was Let, really let's get annoyed. Into the incest moment because I still want to say why exactly I really like them having to go onto that boat, talk to that guy because okay. the uh, the the finale of that scene is them 
holding his hand and connecting these three people that were once connected again symbolically. What I like about this is because the theme we're having here is... Uh, it is quite sentimental, but it has come to resonate with me more over time, which is gratitude to what your parents went through to have you. And that is something this movie does in that moment, right? These kids come out of a time where having a child, raising a child, being able to, you know, live is a luxury. Like, it's the post-war time. So many people, orphans, died, poverty, whatever, everything, dead. These kids managed to survive and... They did it because they had like parents in those days which were struggling against the, their times to make this possible, right? I see my parents who raised me in like dire poverty after becoming jobless and depressed in the in the mid nineties as a huge, tremendous achievement of uh, uh, like huge work they put into making it possible, into putting their energies into you know continuing into the next generation by having me by raising me by providing me a good life i feel that scene echoes all that like because of all these soldiers who died mm -hmm. and because of these mothers who you know had to juggle child poverty post war career everything all at once that is a gratitude that i think is well deserved and well important and it is channeled through this guy who wished for his friends the best whose friends died and who can now see that their friends left something behind in this world and i find that that is touching i find because it connects okay. to the history into the future and that is the moment we see it happen and that is a scene i really like yeah okay so uh, all, all of that like all of that being said and actually like being true that is what the scene is that is what the scene is like doing it's still, I, I think, still think it's a really weak sequence. Like for for a few, like mostly, like you know, dramatic structure reasons. Like 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 Thandi said, like it feels absolutely like tacked on at the end. Um, it, it, it and uh, like it's given like I didn't the, say that. I said that. I said it's glued said enough. Okay. I said. I said. We <laughs> yeah, had, I said the yeah. issue that structurally exists with the scene, right? Is that it's yeah, downstream it's from a from an issue. It. I. I don't think. You know, it is better to say that the uh, uh, chairman resolution was glued in between this, what should have happened, <laughs> connected suppose. directly to the mother scene, kind of, right? Like the idea of, yeah. hey, if you want to learn more, there's this person you can talk to, actually, like, you know, hang out with your father and this, like, good friend. This is, like, the person right. of the photo that yes. connects the history. Like, it connects the dots. And I feel like yeah. this is so, this so, is a okay, strong so, finale. And we had this chairman kind of glued in between, which uh, I'll I'll see that. This is an un inelegant scene. However, I don't think that the last scene necessarily needs to inherit, uh, like, the, the, the negativity from that scene before it. The only reason, the, the, okay. way, they, the way they explain why the last scene, in my mind, is absolutely yeah. ab abhorrent. Um, is that um, so? We, we, I, I need to explain what I, th I think the incest means. Okay. <laughs> oh boy, here we go. So, 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 so we talked earlier a little bit about the incest stuff, right? We're kind of we kind of see it as like, oh, we don't know who, who where our past come from. We don't know um, where you know we, we don't. Everything's yeah, confusing and dark, read. and this kind of thing. Yeah, this this kind, you know, this like that, 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 that's that's your attention. And this kind of like being associated with you know the, the kind of. Difficulty in accessing, you know, one's you know memory of the past and that kind of thing, um, and one's memory of where one came from. But I think that there's another more important level to the incest part of the, of that, and and that is, um, is that of how she changes how it changes how she, um, Umi sees her father for a short amount of time, because in the um, in 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 the in in, in the time when she really she she she. she, 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 she he, you know, he cheated on her mother and had a kid, right? She, this, this we, after that, we, 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 that, that's, that's when we get the, the, the scene where she has a super, um, aestheticized version of her father and her mother, right? With the lights like bringing in, right? That's when we, but, and, and that's, and that's followed immediately by her waking up and seeing the dark clouds and like going outside and like raising the flag with like a, like an angry frown on her face, right? So like, we have her relationship to her father is, is kind of changed in this time, right? Where she understands him in a new light. She's like, oh, look at the broken things he did. Like, look at the bad things he did, right? And and, wow, and that, you know, both well, yeah, makes... Because it implies that he was unfaithful yes, to her yes. mom it, uh, yeah, and um, kept it secret. Correct, correct, yeah. Um, so we, 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 we've, we've, bo we, we've, we've both the, the, you know, the element of her now needing to, to asceticize him even further with the, with the, with the, the, the sentimentalized dream sequence, um, which you know brought her, which has to bring her mother back because she's thinking about her mother now because of how she understands her father in the new light, um, um, right? So she needs to bring her mother and father and make them happy together, right? Because that's because she can't deal with the kind of 
extra layer, like this person who I've been worshiping all my life, right? Is who I've been like blazing flags to actually had issues with it, right? Now, how is that? That is a perfect metaphor for a realization of a kind of troubled, traumatic past that isn't as easy and clean and, you know, as possible, right? That was such an amazing way of, I think, representing her kind of changing understanding of, of, um, of, of, um, 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 of war memory of herself as a war widow, like which I like to call her because that's that's really yeah, what she unquote, is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, 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 but in, in, so she wants to conceive herself as that you know kind of pure daughter in the pure situation with the parents, right? That, that kind of thing. That's why, like you know, she comes down, she, her hair is down, and that the whole scene exists in that way. And what and and so and, and I think you go even further and talk about how it you know kind of represents in, 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 the, 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 like incestuous like um. In, in, incest as like, as like a theme is used in Japanese literature, in post-war literature, um, um, to represent just kind of just kind of the, like how the old Japan and the new Japan's governments kind of jam together, right? We don't really like there's no real disconnect, even they tried to be, right? This is this is the thing. This is this is, these 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 themes are used just to show generally the the twistedness of how Japan came out of the war. But that's like that's that's that's, that's you could kind of think that, but I think that's 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 beside the point, really. Um, um th- th- that sounds like a whole bag of worms. Um, but we, we I, uh, should we open that because th- no, that sounds I, I, like I, 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 I haven't done the research to ready to do okay, that okay. right now. Yes, um, we'll, we'll we'll put a source in the description or something on uh, on this idea. Um, I suppose if Fundy links me a source. <laughs> um, which will never happen. I don't think sources for you. They're all mine. Um, all right, just th- kidding. Fundy's pet um, theory, but, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, but but so the, the point is when we go to the scene and we have this kind of resolution where they both run to the boat. What really bothers me about it is we kind of get this, we 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 go to the past, right? Which she's now reconceptualized to understand as a dark and scarier place than she understood it before, right? And it's, it's no longer that pure aestheticization. And instead of, you know, giving a meaningful resolution to that, we say, oh, no, it was good. Your father was actually just a crazy good guy and helped his, like, his, um, his, his friend out, get his, like, child. So we have all these three military buddies, right? And how, you know, and, and, th- and them being just basically perfect, you know, of soldiers of virtue, right? They're the perfect soldiers that we dream about. Those are the, these, 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 this is this is what the war bereaved um, 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 bereavement um, institutions want you to think. This is this is how they want you to think about soldiers from World War II. We think of them as these beautiful people who just were victims of a horrible thing, you know, that happened to them while they were acting perfectly, you know, you know, um, 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 morally good, right? And so, and we've just, yeah, yeah we've we romanced it. We've thrown, we, we've kind of like, we've, and that's why I say it's a painting over. We, 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 I feel like the the really significant um, step she took to try to reconceptualize her the, the the war memory to reconceptualize her role, her relationship to her father, to that past, is then just kind of like, okay, it's actually just all good now, so it's fine. You can now raise the flag to other people now because now you know everything was fine, you know, and it, it just, it just, it just completely broke my understanding of what the film was trying to do in a really frustrating way. So it, um, it, did, it didn't for me, because I feel like what you're kind of getting down to is that you wanted a realization that her father was not a good person. Not necessarily, but how they made him realize that he was a good person was done in such a hyper romanticization of these soldiers, this kind of, this group of soldiers. You know, I don't like, necessarily I mean, know if it the, was the a hyper romanticization. I, I don't feel like it was a hyper romanticization of soldiers. Um, I, I can see why you would read it that way, but honestly, I, I feel the reading is just as justified as saying, well, you know, it is war. Young men get drafted into the army. They develop like sure, friendships. Sure, sure, sure. The, his wife dies. He dies. Like the child is left over. Well, that's the kind of thing like a, yeah. a person would need to have to take care of, you know, he, but, but, he's but, a good guy. That's true. But like the horrors of war are inscribed in that past anyways right the the history is blurry anyways like a lot of the things you described that the incest metaphor did for you and then you said it's all clean and resolved i don't agree that it's all clean and resolved like he's a good guy but the history is still like full of war of the bomb destruction like people being but drafted somewhere the, okay, dying, okay, you know? I, my, my, my issue with this narrative is that um japan has a really fraught history with turning their their soldiers and their people into victims without, and that's, and that's, a, that's always been a big discussion in the sense of, 
um, sahinin, right? Like that's like this kind of like idea of like, oh, we need to like, you know, like hyper aestheticize. We, we take our soldiers and we put them in, in, in into the shrine. We take, you know, in, in, into the okay. Yasukuni shrine. We take, we, we, yeah. we, 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 the, the, we were bombed and the atomic bombs by the, the Americans. It's kind of, this, this, this narrative is a very specific Japanese narrative. Okay, okay. So we're getting to a very, very base level discussion of progressive media analysis, okay? This is a discussion yeah. that will always be recurring. Here's the question I'll pose to you, okay? It, it, it doesn't need to be resolved here. We probably have disagreements. It seems like we have disagreements. So is the existence of a trope that is problematic the problem? Like, for example, romanticization of soldiers? Or is even every individual incarnation of that trope, well, however benign I, it may be, a problem, right? I just found it not benign because of how I explained it, you know? Well, yeah, it, it, I don't was, really was see how a... that makes it not benign. Like, we're not whitewashing soldiers that committed cruelty. We're talking about a child, like, who has lost yeah, parents yeah, yeah, but... to, to, like, a critical historical circumstance. Yeah, I'm aware, but her, I'm thinking about how her like, relationship even, to the past... Even, like, okay. even, like, her, her dad's role, he, he wasn't, like, uh, like... Uh, 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 what was was he even like in the Imperial Navy? Like he he was he sailed perhaps for the, during like, World War Two, right? But like, he died on a supply ship, right? That is another yeah. thing that's kind of important, that's right? Another, he like, wasn't drafted the, as a soldier, as like a like the Marine Navy yeah, soldier. Died, yeah, yeah, like that's true. But he, he, yes, so he is also more civilian coded than you would usually assume, right? Like we yeah. don't know his involvement yeah. in World War Two. That is another thing. Like I I just think it's a bit too loose. We cannot just. I cannot dis discredit reading him as a soldier, but I cannot also f also fully descri uh, subscribe to the idea that it's whitewashing, like sort of the soldier narrative. It's not. It's, it's not that, it's, uh, okay, it's not that so whitewashing is a soldier. Me, 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 okay, when I say whitewash, I, what I mean is it whitewashes her relationship to the past, in my opinion. Yeah, let, let, let me just mediate this because, like, I, I, I can absolutely see the disconnect here because uh, because uh, uh, Thunder, you like saw the movie and the moment where like turns out like her dad had a, a kid with another woman that moment uh like it clicked for you because like oh realizing that your the idealized past, uh past isn't as ideal as you thought and that and, and that like complicates the present that's a really interesting theme and then you feel like at the end there they just absolutely drop the ball yeah, um meanwhile nyard is like having the whole like gratitude towards the previous generation for the hardships they suffered where like the whole like is it incest or not plotline gets resolved with like understanding the past fully and leads to like a um an optimistic conclusion that's uh, and, and that resonates with uh, with Nyat, you know yeah yeah I, 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 I guess that's where the disconnect is. <laughs> it's um, definitely there. I mean, I, I feel like uh, I could probably see ending up on Thundee's camp on this if I had like started out reading the movie in that direction more, right? But I wasn't. like. Um, so I sort of don't think... I, I thought of think that kind of reading was foreclosed for me by how I approached the movie yeah. from my own my, personal background. My family's, from the, my family's from the South, so like thinking about incest is kind of our bread and butter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, no, but uh, I, I honestly think that that like might point to like a, a weakness of the movie that like it 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 doesn't clearly like clearly enough establish what direction we're going. But, yeah, and, like, I'm definitely the insanely fan. vague. <laughs> I'm definitely a fan of being vague and imprecise. But it's right. It's true that if it allows for yeah. such like completely diametrically opposed readings there should have been something more like if it's my reading yeah. which i think it is because like that's what the interviews talk about and like how um the final scene is like clearly framed right um then there would have been it would have been good to introduce more responsible dealing with the soldier and victim memory right like the, yeah. the yeah. victim story of japanese soldiers um yeah, exactly that that yeah, maybe they should have let uh, Takahata revise the script as well or something. <laughs> you know, maybe Takahata has that shit that, you know. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> once again, it feels like a second draft. It feels like a few more, a few more go bys, and you could have something that fits together much more well. But but um, an interesting I, piece of foreshadowing. I feel like I need to bring this up because our next cast is going to be Wind Rises. You know, Wind Rises was also accused from many sides of romanticizing and like 
being too pro war or yes. too understanding of war. So Miyazaki no, I, I at that time, absolutely. yeah, 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 of I mean, course. Okay. I don't <laughs> think I don't agree with that yes. reading, but it got that backlash. So it seems like I, I, Miyazaki. I, 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 exists. Actually, I actually, I actually, do, I actually do agree with that reading. So, okay, uh, um, we. I mean, I haven't seen the movie in a, in a great while because I'm waiting for the podcast, you know, so like that I have it fresh movie, on my so mind. I'm so excited! But <laughs> I find it interesting what? that we have this 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 through line between this script that Miyazaki has written and the next movie that has gotten uh, yeah. a bit of a. Backlash. I don't want to call it backlash. It wasn't huge. Like, but a, a lot of critics have around it. Cr critics have noticed that they found the treatment with the war lacking because of the perspective we inhabit in Wind Rises, and not to get distracted into Wind Rises, but yeah, okay, <laughs> to draw the 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 the, the through line from here, where we ha having this exact discussion about this movie into the next, where this discussion also seems adequate. All right. Uh, let let me, let me just circle back a bit um, because, like, uh, I, th I think again we're landing on, on the whole like uh, uh, themes versus like uh, dramatization when we're talking about like uh, whether uh, twin cest is twin cest or not. Um, <laughs> no, no, no uh, incest. Sorry, uh, twin cest. That's Game of Thrones. They're, they're not twins. Um, anyway, uh, like so. Um, what the, I I really just have some beef with you now, Nyad, with what you said about the, the themes and you don't care about interiority and all that. Um, it depends because... on the work. I sometimes care about interiority, right? No, like, no, no. no, no. Like, like, let me is, just clarify. Nyad, Nyad, you yeah. think you think you don't care, but you but 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 you do. Like because be, because uh. like the, like I I'm really interested. It's in a weird dude. Okay. How narrative <laughs> like. Yeah. I'm really interested in the function of narrative. That, that's something that I find really fascinating about watching movies because, like, th there's some like there's some alchemy that turns like uh, something like uh, like uh, scattershot and hurried into something like fast-paced and tense. That turns something uh, uh, something from being like slow and and, and like a slog into something deliberate and like just uh, like slow paced. And that stuff is like the craft of making movies. And that craft, like when it works well, then like as all these themes get together and as you have the, uh, an emotionally resonant, uh, like uh, emo emotionally resonant character arc and as uh, it resolves in beautiful ways, that's when the movie magic happens. So, so that that's when the tears start falling. I, like I, not 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 because not because you're like, oh, I uh, I, I recognize what is happening here thematically, no, um, but as in I really feel it in my bones. I disagree. Type of thing, and anyone who watches it can feel it. I disagree. That's Clayton, where it happens. I'll give it very brief. I disagree. I think the centrality of character arcs is a bit overstated. I don't. Deny, okay, like not, I, not I, character I, I, arcs necessarily. I, I, just I, yeah, the yeah. craft of storytelling is not just no, character no, no, arcs. No, 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 no. Hold on, you. I don't like reducing this craft of storytelling to what you just uh, uh, tried to uh, juxtapose. Right, you juxtapose the craft of storytelling with oh, I understand what the scene means. I do cry when it hits me what a scene symbolically means. Maybe this is not the way you engage with movies, but I do. So I will argue that putting too central of a focus on just one of these means is, in my opinion, undercutting that there are more ways than one in which you can really emotionally resonate with a film. I primarily tend to engage with movies where characters are symbols rather than, I guess, subjects of my empathy, right? In most yes. cases, Thundi agrees with me, I think we're on a wavelength here, but with where, where we are kind of looking at how characters in a narrative are utilized to express certain ideas and meanings more so than the character is like a sort of microcosm of subjectivity, of emotions, of experience, of internality, right? And I don't discredit the other style of appreciating it, but I think when talking about movie making, it is really important to keep in mind there's more than one way in which a movie can tell its narrative in which it can tell its meaning that does not necessarily rely on the centrality of the character and its okay, internality okay. and the plot mechanism. Okay, um, so to, to respond to that, um, first of all, uh, absolutely, there's no like, th there's no rigid rule book for storytelling, but you need to like understand like the functions of the tools you're using in order to like break the rules uh, in, in a in a meaningful manner. Um, and uh, second of all, like 
I I I I feel like the whole like that sort of framing uh, puts so much supremacy on uh, on the script level because as because it would mean that as long as the themes fit uh, fit and add up to something meaningful, then like how it is like. No, 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 no. Hold on, hold on. It doesn't have an effect on, that's, that, on how that's it doesn't make any sense. Quite the and opposite. It does have an effect. Quite the opposite. The movie is weaker for its structural problems, and it would be like more engaging, like if it was like if it didn't have these problems. That that's basically what I'm saying, and I find it really fascinating to really like. I I find that one of the useful things in analysis is like finding these. Uh, missing pieces or finding out what why something works and why something doesn't. So I, I, I need to just interject and tell you that you just basically implied that the approach of looking at themes prioritizes script over everything else. And I couldn't disagree more because really uh, this is thinking in a way where symbolism exists only on the level of language, of spoken words, of like written plot details. But this is actually absolutely not the case like music has its own way of oppress- expressing colors have their own way of expressing scenes cinematography camera movement you know all this right i do I not know all this, yes. i do yeah I indeed um i i do not disregard any of this i think especially in how things are expressed is their meaning created right in how colors codify a scene in how um camera movements given a certain impression of you know, kind of what what is going on on screen, or if it's tense, or if it's like a positive thing that we're kind of marveling at, or if the cameras, you know, all of these things are crucially important to the thought of thematic signification that I am, you know, really interested in. The language of talking about themes is often very much existing in the layer of plot, but think about how much time we spend talking about the setting that simply provides like objectively speaking, only the background images where the characters move on. But we talked so long about the settings and what this uh, about the setting, and what it signifies in its historical context and how it is displayed and its anachronisms and all of this. This is exactly what I mean, right? This setting impresses for me and overwhelms me and works for me and has emotional resonance in me and also Latin Quarter, the same thing, because of how well it integrates idea and themes into its representation, into its forms, into its functions, into its modes of how it is being expressed to me, right? Like a beautiful poem about depression does more than a, a written sentence which says this character has depression, right? This is very obvious. And yeah, I think the yeah, film yeah. in filmic language, that functions uh, just the same, you know? That's kind of where, I, you know, we yeah, are closer um, than you think, okay, yet we have still right. differences which are kind of okay, fundamental. Uh, you know? I, I will absolutely concede uh, that point. I, I, sh- I shouldn't have gone there and, uh, and, and, and used like the, like you're focusing like too much on the script. Absolutely. Uh, and I even said earlier that like, uh, give a script to five directors, you get five different films. Indeed. And that, that basically like adds up to like the same thing you're saying. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that, but I, I will stick to my point that it is useful and interesting and worthwhile to like nail down what works and doesn't work on a story level because that's part of what separates a pretty good film with interesting themes from like from Urban Papa Hill from like a masterpiece like Only Yesterday or The Wind Rises Um, and like part of that is just like the straight up and down like craftsmanship of writing a story. See, I, I would I would make the argument that the craftsmanship of writing a story, or like you know, is in having good craftsmanship. What you are doing is setting it up in a way in which you can have more ideas. I don't know. It's like I've always thought that way. Like, have you seen the movie *Liz and the Bluebird*? It's like you know, like a movie built entirely around like the the conception of technical aspects. Every little tiny little technical aspect of the film bleeds into. Um, um, how what the thing means the thing is so built around meta narratives and meta you know meta like um um um, sure these, like, um, 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 um a meta craft and that yeah whole, yeah um, yeah, right? yeah. So yeah like, that's and, that's a great and, example and, of a movie that is very much like and, and about argue, things not in the text but in the yeah. like in, in the way it's presented and, I would, and I would, there and are I, tons of examples of those yeah. kinds of I'd argue movies. that I'd argue um, that that all good craftsmanship is is presenting things in a way that allows them to you know a, be understood easier or better, or maybe not easier because maybe sometimes you want to be not easier is better. But being understood in a more a way that more that fits the the um, the idea at hand, 
and B, that was a thing to have more multifaceted ways of being understood. That, and that, that's all I think good craft really can be called. That's all right, I think right. you can really call good craft. So I, I don't right, think there's we, any real difference between craft and themes in that regard. I, all right, I, we've I, been uh, we've yeah, been way indeed. out on a on a detour on like the very purpose of narrative. And, yes, which uh, is and good and stuff like that. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I like the reason why I wanted to like uh, add this is because I still haven't finished my critique of that ending. Oh, go um, go ahead, go ahead. Because my first point was. It's tacked on. Like it, it, you could like remove it and instead just have a, a, a conversation about it, and that that, that 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 would be cool. And it, it's it's disconnected from the Latin Quarter, and we agree at least that it's dis disconnected from the ending of the Latin Quarter plot. I mean, Second they literally all, jump in. Yeah, they literally yeah, jump they in. Literally hey, jump, attention! On, let's go to plot. the other plot. <laughs> it, it actually yeah. reminds me of, of like Spirit Away. You know, like the, they yeah. finish like with um Yuzuniba's house, and then it's like. Oh well, um, you've got your other story waiting over there, and then like Taku shows up and they fly up and they they have to guess the pigs. It's like it, it kind of reminds me of that, right? Or is this like, oh, you have to go do this other thing and they run off? <laughs> yeah, Saki <laughs> really isn't a great except... writer, is he? Right? He's like <laughs> he likes this shit. But I mean, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, but I mean that's I mean, fairy tale I mean, logic. With, it's with away, it's okay so. because it's it's following dream logic, not fairy tale logic, it's dream logic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> second, uh, my second critique, which I kind of got into, is. It re-resolves something that was already resolved plot-wise. Like we are, like as an audience, we already like pretty much like understood that the mother was was telling like the actual story, and the only thing this was doing was like reconfirming that. Where like plot-wise, it doesn't really resolve that plot. It just confirms that it was resolved earlier, which is not a very strong way to end a, a movie. I mean, um, what I'd say here is the same as that earlier, right? Like, it re-resolves, but it does so by introducing a, a, for me, beautiful and meaningful image. And I guess that's what I value, ultimately. Uh, all right, uh, sure thing. Uh, my third thing is, like, it it kind of, like, it kind of opens more questions. Like, if this guy is, like, alive and very much, like, uh, like loved these, uh, these, these old, like, friends of his, like, for some reason, they didn't keep in touch that much. Yo, he on a boat. Uh, yeah, 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 I know he's on a boat. <laughs> but like the idea that it would like, like that, that, that like ten years would go by, and like she would not have met who who was like almost like a half brother to her. So, yeah, uh, or or their family. So that just feels weird. I, I agree like, that, especially that... with how much he he emphasizes that. He, like they were so good friends in, and he's so glad he could meet them in like, literal terms definitely true yeah. in symbolic saying, terms i saying. kind of appreciate how it mirrors the theme of a repressed past that yeah, kind of exactly. is uncertain yeah. and undiscovered that, that's the whole sure, point they're, sure. they're, 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 um, they're, 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 they're all war buddies but you can't have your war buddies after the war that doesn't make any sense because you not because then you're unrepressing it you're actually dealing with these real people so we have to if we've understood them as trauma a traumatic you know entity the entity being war buddies, right? Um, then, 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 then we see them much more clearly, right? As they're symbols, because they're not people; they're symbols. A ab absolutely, and like thematically, yes. Uh, but like, I, I mean, could you have made this sort of story without it being that contrived? Maybe who knows? It just like to to, to quote a certain character from the movie. It feels kind of like a soap. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess like a cheap melodrama, I think they say, or something True. like a cheap, yes. cheap melodrama. Uh, okay. so that, so that was, you know, I, so I kind of find this ironic, right? Like they they have the line. It feels like a like like oh incest, like what yeah. this feels it's like called, it's almost a cheap okay, melodrama. That, but a, then in the end, they do the most like melodrama scene yes. possible. Absolutely. Yes, <laughs> that's the word for this. It's it's called lampshade hanging. Um, it's it's a, it's a trope. It's named after um like like a. In, in in like old silence when so when uh, the protagonist is like running away and they just grab a lampshade and put it on themselves and and, and people expect it to be a lamp um, and it's like winking at the audience they're like whoa they bought that but like they did buy that it's 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 a trope where like you where you like do something that's kind of stupid or, or or just like a, an obvious example of a trope and then you just mention it that we are doing this trope right now in order for the audience to be like, oh, they understand that they're doing this trope. That means it's smarter, but it's not. They're still doing the thing. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> where was I? Yes. So that was third of all, uh, was like opens like weird, like kind of opens questions. Um, 
for the wall, it doesn't like like there's there's no meaningful choice happening, and it even like invalidates the well it it kind of invalidates the whole like drama of like what they were going through by just saying nah it's cool um which like is pr probably inevitable when you're doing this specific story but it just like it just ends in a non choice and it just ends in a all your like all your waffling and worrying like you, don't don't worry about it so i'm going to say um, something that will upset your sensibilities of how sure. it is supposed to be written i feel like the need for example to put urgency in a chase scene in there was for example, yes. was purely mechanical. I that, feel that's like that's my next one. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I anticipated it. Um, I feel it was purely mechanical because I understand a lot of things in movies mechanical, right? If an exciting scene happens, it music rouses, like things happen on screen. It, it's it trans trans uh, uh, conveys an image of chaos, and it sort of uh, 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 rouses a kind of emotional response to that image. I feel like the linking of the image of the chase was really only linked to the internal anxiousness of these characters to finally, like, materially connect to a person from the past to establish this connection, right? Like, it's not... So, like, there's no plot urgency. Like, there's no literally, like, narrative urgency where we, where we, like... Of course, the fake urgency of, like, the ship's gonna leave, it's gonna take a couple of months, which doesn't have anything to do with the plot, right? But for me, that's not necessarily negative because I recognize how the scene, through its mechanical interaction with, like, the uh, uh, chase sequence, conveys... The their internal anxiousness going into that uh, situation towards you know, this uh, I, I, reveal. I suppose you're, 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 kind, of, you're kind of paraphrasing J.J. Um, uh, Abrams, um, a man who has no idea how to construct a story, but yet still is paid millions of dollars to do so by big big media uh, companies. Um, like He has straight up said at one point, uh, I, I, I think it was like when he was making the, the new Star Trek movies, that like, um, uh, like one of the actors was asking, like, like it, it, the script says that I'm like, like running. Uh, what are we running to? What's what's the threat here? And he's like, Oh, don't worry about it. If you just r run real quick and uh, and make it feel uh, seem urgent, then then the audience is gonna buy it. Yep, and, and I think like, that no. that's very smart. I think that is <laughs> incredibly smart in a way that J.J. Abrams might not realize. But I think this is one way I in which formal. I, I think I think this is I, one way in which formal devices can function, where we have like uh, 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 atomized meanings and code and sort of mechanical interactions between audience and the film, which you can assemble into meaningful images. And I think meaningful images does not necessarily require plot <laughs> as a, a did, guiding did, skeleton. Did you guys? Did you guys notice the kind of two-dimensionality of the backgrounds in this movie? Um, I was pretty surprised because Ghibli movie backgrounds very much, very, very rarely go for a two-dimensional feel. They always go, you know, they always want this. Well, uh, they all yeah, usually layers. want extreme, I haven't extreme noticed that, actually. Like, but you mean this, like this a lack of parallax scrolling? I, I, I think, yeah, I guess there's a little, yeah, little there's parallax lots, uh, yeah, Especially compared to their, like, recent... Uh, yeah, but, yeah, but also just like, just, like, just, like, just, like, just like how their, how the backgrounds were painted, like leaves and stuff. They didn't look like leaves. They looked like a painting. Of like of like on a two dimensional space like and and I noticed that and, and and actually I was thinking that here I, I didn't really didn't like understand why but Nerd you mentioning this kind of um mechanical act without a, any real reason for it to exist right it's the, it's there because it, it is is pr providing X role right is X structural role in the film right and the same thing as we have you know the scene the movie has a lot of scenes like that that feel like we have to we have to provide an X structural thing and so we will do it and so it's it's almost like almost um. I I I I I don't want to bring up the word super flat, but I will anyways because I love it. Um, um, that sounds like a stand. Please don't say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I'm not going to explain what super flat means, but it, it it gives this kind of idea of just like you know exaggerated two dimensionality that this film seems to like revel in in a lot of ways. Like it's very explicitly does not have characters. There are no characters in this film. Like, like, <laughs> yeah. The idea I of agree with that. By the way, it's this. just yeah. not yeah. necessarily a criticism in my no, view. I'm not, I'm not yeah. criticizing it right now. I'm just, I'm yeah. just taking it. I, I, I've never cared whether they're characters or not. Um, um, but and and and, and, I, and I wonder, I wonder how like you know, the, take the scene you're you're at the end. You know, where where we 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 catch the boat. We we are now. You know, we we've we've been resolved. We now have that anxiety of the past. We we, we the, now can understand it. Like we now we can appreciate our parents, right? I, I wonder. I wonder if the whole film kind of exists as an excuse to say that, in mm. a way. 
It's yeah, like, it's like yeah, a bunch of going through the motions to then. Yeah, yeah it's absolutely, to, that, to, that's what it is. That, to, that's to, the, to, like, to, get, to, 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 to deliver a kind of like message of gratitude to his father. Yeah, yeah, that kind of summarizes like the the problem. It 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 feels like it's going through the motions. Um, I don't think I'm not saying there's a bad thing. I I just wonder if that's kind of the whole. No, no, that, the I think that is like a bad way to make a film when you could have made something that engages and doesn't just explain. Yeah, see, here, like, here we have feel postmodern. Like scene, postmodern I feel like Chad's the ending is funny. to me. <laughs> Like the, the ending is like just a character explaining to these two kids that like, oh yeah, your mother was right and here's some extra info. And he does say that like, oh, I'm so happy to have finally met you and, and they like hold hands and stuff. And that's like a pretty good image. But like, first of all, I, I think it's pretty flatly directed, that whole thing. Like this is like a man who like, who reconnects with his like long dead brothers in arms and... It's aboard a, a ship that is about to head out, and it just feels like three people having like j just a a formal conversation with each other, and it, yeah. and it, it doesn't really feel like it, it. It really like we don't really see it like hit the uh, like uh, Umi and Shun. They the, their movements aren't really that lively. Like it just it just feels like it just falls flat for me personally, and and I think it's that's actually like a problem that actually goes through much of the movie is like it's so muted and the main characters are so like unerringly like polite and straightforward and like yeah Shun jumps out of off the roof and that's the most interesting thing he does in the whole movie and that's the first sh scene he's in like 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 in terms of like characters expressing themselves through movement so, so i agree that it's and, muted and, and, and like what when i watched later watched the, the the documentary the nhk documentary um when like miyasaki's main thing the first thing he instantly noticed was like nah uh, it's it's not lively enough and even like the producer was like you need to do some revisions because this main character just isn't like isn't really working as a protagonist that's absolutely like one of the weaknesses of the film, even if it might have been worse before the revisions, it's absolutely a problem with the film. That, that It lacks that life. And that's why, like, the supporting cast become the stars the instant they arrive, because, like, the art girl in, in the boarding house, the um, the weird characters in in the Latin quarters, they, they all just feel so much more alive than, like, the main plot of the movie does. And I, I think, think that just that's just kind of like, you know, Actually, I, could have um, done better. Um, a voice and I were talking about this yesterday, about this kind of concept of where the reason why Goro presents these characters, they're very similar to Aaron, right? They're kind of like are steeped in postmodern malaise. Um, so they, they, uh, this uh, is kind Aaron, of... Aaron, sorry? Yes, Aaron, the main character of Earthsea. Right, thank you. Yes, um... And so he, this, these kinds of like, they kind of like, are, they are going through the motions. That is like a very much a part of it because that's kind of how Goro imagines himself in his, in comparison to, in like, in his relation, in relationship to the older generation, which he clearly has like a lot of like respect and love for, right? He sees these kinds of like people in the fifties and sixties who had to work through a much harder time and had to like build Japan, right? And then, and, and, and he, he sees it from the, you know, perspective of a person who grew up in the eighties, the most, you know, the place where Japan was economically as, you know, as well off as it ever was and life was as easy as it ever was in Japanese history and it's like and and this kind of characters who just don't have anywhere to go they don't have a space they don't have a presentation right they don't have they don't have a, they don't have a world to explore that's and that's why they kind of come up with this kind of flatness and they kind of have frowns in their face because I, I feel like because in, in for, I, I, it's a little, I don't want to like I guess I'm a little psychoanalyzing Goro um, but um, yeah, yeah. I, I, um, again um, like uh, like but, I think we talked about in the very first uh, episode of the of the cast but like it, it is like uh wh while it's not super useful to analyze uh, an author through their work it's it's interesting to analyze the work through its author yeah and so i and so I, I kind of see these kind of these kind of figures as you know as i said before like 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 they're 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 
they're they're wallowing in their postmodern malaise. They don't they they like oh life is easy for us. We don't have anywhere to go. We don't have any like kind of direction. We don't have the space. And I think that he kind of contextualizes this as putting these kinds of eighties characters in the sixties. Yeah, way, yeah, yeah. Um, I fully agree. This is um, what I wanted to say about the flatness earlier, right? I had yeah. had the sense that the, the 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 Yokohama is like the Yokohama of faded photographs in a way. Yeah. And it is filled with romanticizations. They ex explicitly in an inter interviews, they talk about how they made Yokohama more bustling than it would have been in the historical time period because they wanted to convey an historicized or like brighter image of that Yokohama in that time frame. Something that more aligns with the cultural memory of that Yokohama than it does with yeah. the real Yokohama. The flatness for me comes from the idea of, well, like a faded photograph, right? You say, you're say you saying like putting the 80s malaise of these characters, which by the way, they were 80s characters, right? In that shoujo manga. Yep. <laughs> I don't know how much carried over, right? Like we couldn't verify that, obviously, because the manga wasn't translated or available to us. But um, the, the way in which this Yokohama is remembered in this movie is, in a way, is flat. These characters are, in a way, uh, uh, troubled by their malaise. And I feel like these things create a sense of anachronism, one that is not a literal like wrong facts about the time period or like out of place things, but one that is structural, like in the sense of it, how it, these things are even it, perceived in the first place. It's, just, it's, it's especially interesting, I think, from the perspective of um, of we, we're taking an 80s character, we're putting them in the 60s and then making them think about the 40s, right? Yeah. We're trying, we're taking this kind of like aimlessness, right? The, our Aaron, our Earthsea character, who's like kind of in this world where he has no real place to go, he has no real path he's just kind of he's killed his father and he kind of sits around like with, like no real place way to way, way to deal with that and we say how do we put them in a space where things there actually were things to do where there were student protests where the war memory was such an important part of life where like you know where where we were just barely starting to become economically like powerful like these kinds of things like and I, and, and like you can argue that's an interesting thing but i think it's also part of why the movie i don't like the movie that much why why i think it doesn't have it doesn't have a real conclusion because it's not trying to do anything it's just kind of aimlessly romanticizing about a past which where to, as, to, as a way of trying to um redeem the um the aimless present um i i i kind of uh, understand where you're coming from here for me um it feels more like an exercise in trying to remember a cultural memory and that the modifications that occur to that memory as we go along which is really interesting in like formal ways but I suppose I understand the critique that you're saying that the sort of 80s postmodern malaise character does not seem to lead to good resolutions of like all the thematic overarching lines within that sort of plot outside of the sentimentality that works for me, but not for uh, the, uh, you two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, yeah. You know, I have and to the, say I, I, though... And, 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 and I don't disagree that there are a lot of interesting cultural memories that come from the film. That's, I, I mean, I spent most of my time talking about, like, I got really excited because I was like, look at all these cool, like, memories that we're going to explore. But I think that's, that's, I think that is my ultimate issue with how the structure of the film does not deliver on those memories. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I, uh, I'm, I'm not as down on the movie as I think uh, Thundy is, um, but... This is my I, least I, favorite I, Ghibli film. Yeah, I'm not that down on it. Um, but... Uh, it, again, it's 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 a decently all right film. I think the blooming romance is really well observed. Like the the little looks they give give each other. Like you, it, it it's it's really it's really clear just from like the visually how they interact with each other that they into each other, which is really like really nice and refreshing. Uh, like like as in it's not either like um, you know. Uh, well, it's a boy and a girl, so obviously they're in love, uh, and it just actually comes out of nowhere. And it's and neither is it like just super duper obvious, and everyone is always like, uh, 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 "Whoa, so in love!" And they and they're always like blushing to to the point of like absurdity and stuff. Now it's it's just really nice and 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 chill and like an understated, uh, pr pretty well done. So um, like like and, and there are bright spots in the movie of like. The way it handles some themes, uh, some good directing choices, but it doesn't come together in any like like broader sense. And I just, it it's just like muted throughout. I, I, it never really, like the few times it came to life, felt like disconnected and incidental, and like I I just wasn't that engaged with it. Which is which is why I find it so useful to like take a 
take a deeper look at, at, at what the causes of that are. So I, I when we set out to create this podcast project, right, right at the very beginning, we had a vision for it, which is very different from what it ended up becoming. But I think this time around, this podcast we've just created uh, comes closer to the original vision, which was we will have disagreements on the podcast, which we will be discussing in detail as we analyze the film. It happened very rarely in the past. We had we had like a one or, one or two times, like we had some yeah, but... on Arietti, but like overall it's mainly because yeah. we, 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 we most did, of we the did movies it. are undisputed masterpieces yes yeah. and well, we're mostly just gushing in also, different ways also I've, I've argued in like half the cast i've been yeah, here ocean so. waves was a big fighting <laughs> one as well but you know that is fine uh, <laughs> i appreciate that we uh, um get this element in here i think the conversations that resulted from the this were very good we went into deep uh, approaches to how to analyze art and media in general how to appreciate it in general and i think that's something um, we didn't have much of an opportunity to in many of the casts we had before so that's a good one but i think uh, unless you any of you two have some really pressing things I, I think we've reached a good point to wrap up this podcast uh, I don't think I have anything else other than just an observation that this movie is really, um, it's really fascinated by the, uh, the movement of like everyday objects and tools. Definitely. Like in almost every scene, like there's, uh, like in, in a lot of scenes, there's always like something happening. Like you have the beginning with all the cooking and all the same in Tales uh, of Earth, all, all by the, the way, right? And, and, and the moving around the table. And you have in the Latin quarters, everyone's like fidgeting with stuff. And you have like how the, uh, the main couple are like bonding with like the old school, uh, you know, printer that like literally inked a print onto something. Same, same with Tales, Tales of Earthsea, yeah. by the way. Like, the the yeah, idea yeah, that that's, Aaron that's had to, movie. like, learn the, the hard farm work and get, like, the, the blisters on his hands to, you know, really get a mm -hmm. place of... a sense of place and belonging. And it also relates, I think, to how Studio Ghibli in general seems to operate on the Miyazaki philosophy of, you know, draw by hand because then you can actually feel what you're drawing. Like, the idea of yeah. not yeah. going... Too, too digital, you know. Um, oh, and I, I yeah. forgot to mention uh, the uh, the Latin Quarter, like cleaning up, like lots of detail in what was happening and how everything like worked. I I just find that like it it's something the movie like seems to like. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it is just a Studio Ghibli thing that they they like. I mean, I or, didn't or mean like, just like a yeah. Studio Ghibli thing, right? Like there's a lot of mm -hmm. sense behind a sort of putting characters, grounding them in their setting, immersing them in their contemporary times by making them make use of the tools, devices, and things that structure everyday mm -hmm. life, right? Uh, we mentioned briefly at one point, like the feminist discourses of the washing machine, right? And I think it was in the 60s, like American feminists caught on to the idea of the, the washing machine being a liberator of the woman because now that the washing machine takes away the fucking terrible task of having to wash clothes, there's much more time to go around, like... You know, uh, the interesting idea is how the interaction with everyday objects shape our experience. And I think to make a nostalgic movie about a time period, uh, you'd be remiss to not depict the everyday operations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Especially, uh, especially uh, when you do it. Part of yeah. it yeah. And the film did it in a cool way because it, like, you know, it was anachronistic about how it presented that past. Oh, yeah. Like with the race, the race maker. Um, um, all I want to say um, is that I feel like this movie. Um, Thinks itself as um, a kokusai toshi, but I really think it's noon kokusai toshi. Oh no! Don't be rude, <laughs> poor Goro. Okay, I, I, I kind of think this. I, I kind of think this movie does kind of board up and ignore a lot of the issues that it really pretends to deal with, and that's <laughs> just my issue with it. So, so here's one thing, right? Uh, we are doing this uh, podcast. We're following the meta narrative of Goro Miyazaki. We're gonna learn more about Goro when we get to uh, the TV series he directed, Ronya. Uh, uh, Robert's daughter, whatever, uh, and uh, yeah. Yo Yo Wick and the Witch, uh, uh, the movie, the full CG movie that he directed later on, and I I want this narrative arc to this um that to this three act structure I'm gonna call it be first of all you know Goro being low on himself, kind of uh, struggling with Tales of Earthsea, then my narrative, and uh, I, this this will not be uh, uh, ruined by revisionists like you two that Goro came into himself and created a great movie uh, in in From Up and Poppy Hill. But then he fell into the dark abyss of CG and will but, never but, return. But, 
that's my but the already made a great film. Earth, Earth, Earthsea is also is already a great film. Well, you should have just should, should have been then. Should have been there because <laughs> um, I mean it's a, it's a it's a terribly made film, but I like I like it, I like it from a, I li- I like I like what it means. <laughs> I like I like I like I like in its terribleness. Right. Wow, I, I I think that's like your that 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 would make you my arch nemesis because like I spent the that whole cast like just talking about why it didn't like const- like in terms of narrative construction work out anyway uh yeah I, th- I think my addition to this arc is um i mean goro is still like dealing with themes of absent fathers oh, and yeah. uh, and existing and and role models uh in the within the film uh, like the the adoptive father and the chairman and stuff uh and but he seems he seems more confident he uh he see he uh he adds something to this movie um that wouldn't have been there otherwise i think and that's the sign that he's like actually he has come into his own as a director um yeah. but unfortunately he might just not be that good at it is what i'm uh, my fear no is. that's the sad narrative he wanted to be a director <laughs> all his life you got to give it to him and he he did become a director that's he true he did achieve his dream and like uh, similar to what uh, Hayao said about his, his first movie, like he did an honest job, and like here, <laughs> like that, like, like that, that's damning it with faint praise. But I think honestly, like in this case, I think that that that's a bit of praise I would give him. Like he did a, he he did like the job of directing, and he added something meaningful to the script, and that's like that's the definition of like doing the job of a director so he can do it but again i mean you can't you just because your name is miyasaki doesn't mean you, you can be miyasaki and unfortunately s- you are still goro speaking of miyasaki we mentioned it before the wind rises is going to be the next movie we're going to be covering it's again by hayao well, miyasaki that's gonna be yes. a one. It, 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 probably like 10 hours maybe it, yeah. it's gonna be fucking I, I think wa- that... buck wild i don't know like we're gonna try and get as much time to research in as possible hopefully no delays hopefully we can get it out in september no promises anyways if you want to support our arduous and deep and long research process please consider donating on patreon patreon.com slash nausicast uh double a and uh, it, it would be really great to be appreciated. Other than that, we have a Discord server. You can come in, yell at us about how wrong my movie takes are, about how wrong Platon's movie takes are. Don't yell at Thundee. Thundee's takes are correct. Um, <laughs> then also you should, you know, just subscribe to the YouTube channel and follow our podcast on whichever podcasting app you prefer. With that, I would say, everybody... Um, I I think we've concluded a long and deep podcast and nobody's ever talked this much about from Up on Poppy Hill before. Um, I'd say goodbye, everybody. Uh, I think uh, just one more call to action. Um, go go to Wikipedia and my anime list and all this, that stuff and uh, and fix the uh, yeah. Poppy Hill manga thing. It is set in the 80s. It is not set in the 60s. Fix you heard it. it here first, folks. Um and also, uh, go into the comments and let us know, is, uh, is, uh, is Thundee right that incest is wincest? <laughs> Thanks for listening. Always go yeah. for the incest ending. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. See ya. Bye.